Life's too short to exercise. I'm just gonna be honest. There are so many better things to do than exercise. It's okay to be fat. Just a reminder while you're scrolling through lots of videos of annoying skinny people. Men are not meant to be dominant. Men are meant to be submissive. Nobody cares about when you do that and there's like muscles there. Nobody cares about that. We don't want to see that. Fitness and health can save the world. Everybody look, we're in a war. And you trainers and coaches, you're the soldiers. Everybody pay attention. They want you sick. They want you unhealthy. They want you reliant. Fitness is the weapon. This is how we can win this war. Let's talk about this. Oh, talk this about is the on. way. They want, yeah. you, they want you fat. They want you lazy. They want you low testosterone. They well, do. Yeah. So they people are like- Conform, comply, yeah. and just sit there. Well, I mean, people are like, who's they, right? Who's they? All right. Um, you know, we, to paint the picture a little bit, it's, um, I mean, we could be more specific, you know, big pharma, government, marketers of products and services. Why do they want you that way? Uh, Money. Dependent on them. Yeah. If you're unhealthy, you consume more. If you're unhealthy and you feel insecure, you're easily manipulatable. You don't feel empowered. It's easy to get you to buy things. Uh, the markets reflect this. You walk into the grocery store, look at all the products that are geared towards, you know, technically unhealthy behaviors or people. So they want to promote that. Healthy, fit, and I mean health in the in the truest sense, like total, like health, not just like you look buffed or whatever, but you're really secure and healthy. You feel empowered. Like you don't consume as much. You don't rely on others or 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 feel like you need the safety and promises of others as much. So it's hard to manipulate you. And um, this is definitely a war, and it's a, it's coming from all angles. And f fitness solves this. Healthy, fit, secure people, they don't want that. They don't want that. Do you think that? This is a product of what happens in, unfortunately, in like a capitalist society. Do you think that at one point, um, because we are so driven by money and making more, that eventually you're going to get evil actors that are going to find ways to manipulate the masses to get to get the most amount of money out of them? That's a good question. Uh, but the truth is that those uh, desires exist whether we I know no matter what system we're in right, right. So no matter what yeah. the evil act, so in it's any like form the yeah, so I, know, I know the next question I would have the follow up is you know is there a better system than that because no matter what you're you're going to find evil actors no matter what there's going to be people that manipulate but is this and so is this more of a product of evil in society or is it more of a product of because we incentivize making more money. Well, the, the, you know, the commissars in, in, the, in, in the Soviet Union uh, were just as power hungry and greedy as, um, you know, owners of corporations or, you know, the, 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 the investors in, in Pfizer or Big Pharma, for example. So it's, it's no different. But the difference is in markets, the consumer has more power to influence. So this is where, this is where things get really interesting. Think about all of the collective innovation um, and ingenuity that we have as a society. Now think of where it gets directed, right? It gets directed towards the products and services that the consumer wants. Right. So if the products and services that the consumer wants reflects good health, this is where we're going to get innovation. Mm -hmm. If the products and services that the consumer wants is to distract us, to numb us, to medicate ourselves, then that's where the innovation goes. Like, there's no better example than the internet. If you look at the internet, so much innovation goes towards porn sites. So much innovation goes to porn sites. Wow. Why? Because they get so much use. Imagine if the if that much consumption power went to people who are like, we want to solve real problems. I want real health. I don't want to just numb this headache or this joint pain or distract myself from 
depression or whatever. I won't like, imagine if all the innovation went in that direction. Imagine yeah. if you walked into the grocery store and the average consumer wasn't just looking for something fast and tasty, but was looking for something nutritious and healthy, something that was really nourishing, right? Imagine what the products would look like or what the grocery store <coughs> would end up looking like. So we have a lot of power, yeah. but the key is to know and understand, you know, where we're going and what the where the direction is and who is trying to manipulate. I think well, that's this the key. is yeah, this is always the optimism for me is is to see that that's really where we have the most say at all is like where we're going to spend our money and, and our and what we do in terms of like our behaviors. Um, and at the top, if you want to look at it as as you know, companies and, and government uh, handlings of these things, trying to kind of shape culture and move in a certain direction. You know, maybe it's money driven, maybe there's other reasons for it, control, whatever it is. But as, um, you know, in the capitalist kind of setting, at least we have that the ability to, you know, spend our money here um, and, and, you know, be it, like have have some kind of say in terms of like how we 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 do things and and how we empower ourselves uh, with healthier practices so that way you know we we at least have that bit of freedom within the system. Yeah. So uh, look, uh, no market is impervious to this. Okay, our space, our space is as corrupt as the other ones I just mentioned. I'll give you a simple example. We've talked about this on the show many times. The gym industry. If you look at the winning model. The winning model in the gym industry is the following. Charge a cheap enough membership to where people sign up. They don't show up because if they show up, you've got to close your doors. You've got too many members. So they don't show up. It's cheap enough that they sign up and that they don't cancel because it's only nine bucks a month. The winning model in the gym industry is literally, we want people to not work out. We want people who are unhealthy. Literally, that's yeah. what they want. If the gym industry... We're really doing this in the in the right way. What I mean by the right way is like we're really trying to help people. It wouldn't look that way. It wouldn't be a nine dollar a month membership. You couldn't have a thirty thousand square foot facility in a city with a million people and charge nine dollars a month if people are actually showing up, actually working out. Like the people who who are the in gym, by the way in the gym industry they talk about this. This is like a dirty secret. The people that cost you money, that you lose money on in the your gym. that use the gym every day. The hardcore, oh, yeah. consistent members. They don't <laughs> buy your supplements. It's not built for that. Yeah, they don't show up and buy all your supplements. They don't buy all your crap. They pay their their monthly fee, and they show up every day and use your equipment. Yeah. So For hours. For hours, right? <laughs> so the, the, my, my point with this is, is that we literally, and I say we as those of us in the space as coaches and trainers, we actually um, are soldiers in this war because- Healthy, fit, secure people. Look, let me put it this way: Look at all the um, look at the, the big problems to society. Look at uh, you know people like to talk about the climate. Look at the carbon footprint and the pollution that sick, unhealthy, dependent people create versus healthy, fit, and secure people. It's a lot higher. Uh, look at innovation: who innovates more? And then look at where the innovation goes. Mm -hmm. Healthy people want to innovate in a direction tend to want to innovate in a direction that's healthy. Unhealthy people are looking to innovate in a direction that is less healthy. Look at productivity. In an eight-hour workday, a healthy person who feels good is far more productive. Um, look at violence. This is a fact, okay? Now we now have lots of data to support this. None of this is, by the way, that I'm saying is just anecdotes. This is all fact. When you exercise right and you eat right, nothing's more powerful at lifting people from the everyday type of depression that people experience or anxiety, it makes you feel less irritable, mm -hmm. more positive, meaning every the normal stuff that happens in your life, you're stuck in traffic. Yeah. If you're fit and healthy, you're less likely to be so pissed off by it. You're more resilient you're, towards it. You're more resilient. You're less likely to want to have conflict with people. Right. You're more tolerant. Here's another one. Tolerance is a big buzzword. Tolerance, inclusion. By the way, those are weaponized by uh, politicians mm -hmm. who want to control you. The most tolerant, inclusive place on earth, I'll make this argument. In fact, I, I did a post like this. Father Steve, who's the producer for Word on Fire, is a, a Catholic, very popular Catholic uh, podcast. So he's, he's an actual priest. When I made this tweet, he actually commented underneath and he says, I'm afraid you're right, and it's even better at doing this than the church. The most inclusive place you'll find anywhere is a gym, a hardcore gym. You go into a hardcore gym, 
it doesn't matter what you look like. I don't, they don't nobody cares what your political beliefs are. Nobody cares what religion uh, you, you, you worship. Nobody cares. You're in there working hard. Everybody's working hard. There's a, there's a mutual amount of respect. And the most tolerant, inclusive people in that gym <clears throat> are the most hardcore people. And anybody who's ever experienced, who's done this knows it's totally true. So uh, this is a very powerful, very powerful vehicle that has tremendous um, benefit, not just the aesthetic, you know, the obvious, I look better, or the health, I feel better, you know, all that stuff. All right, today's giveaway is the RGB bundle, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below this video within the first 24 hours that we drop it, subscribe to this channel, and then turn on notifications. If you win the RGB bundle, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a sale right now. There's actually three days left for this sale. Our beginner strength training program, MAPS Starter, is 50% off. And then our bundle that includes MAPS Anabolic and MAPS uh, Prime, excuse me, Prime and Anabolic in a bundle, the starter bundle is also 50% off. So both of those, three days left for that 50% off discount. Again, if you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Man, just think of right now, if you look around the world, look around your, your look around your town, imagine if everybody were 20% healthier in the truest sense, not 20% look better, but I mean healthier. How different do you think experiences would be for people, uh, you know, in your town? Yeah. So this is a big deal. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I know I'm, I'm making it sound like we're, you know. This is like this, <laughs> like this, this it's crazy this crusade. This yeah. is for real, Fitness dude. Crusade. This, and if you're a trainer or coach, by the way, I'll, I'll say this is a, and you guys managed uh, trainers, you know this. It's really hard to tell, to get a trainer who comes in and starts. It's hard to teach them how to, let's say, build their business or make money. Not mm -hmm. because necessarily they don't want to do that, but because they're not driven necessarily by that. They're driven by this. They know they have this deep fire. Like I want to do this because I believe in this. And so as a manager, I used to have to teach them how like building a business actually helps you do that. So trainers and coaches listening right now, especially those that haven't been jaded by the fitness space yet. Yeah. Right now, as I'm talking, you know how they feel. They're all like, oh yeah, that's exactly why I'm doing well, it. Well, it falls in line too. And we had that conversation with Arthur Brooks and talking about like how you're going to make the most impact in the world really is to shape uh, your local uh, community and, and to do it like one person at a time. Um, and think about that in terms of yourself and, and what you're, uh, grow, how you're growing and, and what that's going to do in terms of like affecting everybody else around you. And then from there it grows, it fosters, it, it, uh, spreads, uh, and it's just such a more effective approach is to like be able to kind of take that self-assessment and, mm -hmm. um, uh, take personal accountability and to improve every day and, uh, try your best to kind of infuse that in other people. And who does that better than personal trainers and working with somebody one-on-one -on -one and helping them grow and foster that mentality and that, that ability that they have that strength and that ability to shape their lives in a better direction. Yeah. hundred percent. How optimistic are you guys that we can even win that war? And is it more, we just want to lose, lose less than what we're already losing. Cause I, I, I totally agree on everything that you're saying. My fear is that human behavior has already proven that we're going to take the uh, Easy easier path. route. I would rather numb myself with cigarettes, with alcohol, with food, with drugs. And of course the, uh, you know, big, the big corporations know this. And so it's us against them on the messaging, yeah. right? We're trying to, pr they, our message is it's going to be hard. It's going to take a long time. Um, it's going to be worth it, you know? So um, can we win this war or is it, we just are trying to lose less? <laughs> That's a, you know what? I tell yeah. you what, I'll reframe that. Cause look, Adam, you're a, a, a serial entrepreneur, a successful serial entrepreneur. When you start a new business, do you, um, <clears throat> Do you inundate yourself with the statistics or do you go in there being like, I'm going to win? Yeah, you have to believe you're going yeah. you you to win. If you're going to, you have to be a little delirious. That, hey, <laughs> listen, <laughs> you yeah. got to be a little. I don't fear the soldier who goes to war who's like, man, I don't know if we're going to win. I fear the soldier who's like, I don't care if I I'm, die. I'm going right, and right, I'm going right. to win and I have right. that belief. So if we're going to win this war, there's only one way to do it, and that's to believe that you can. Whether or not we do or not, I don't care. 
That's we're the, gonna fight that's it so, anyway. That's the right attitude. I think that's the right answer because I, I and what a great analogy to you know just having success in entrepreneurship because eighty percent will fail. That's so right. I, and I think that that's yeah. the odds are stacked. I think that's what we're sure. facing. Yeah. I think we're facing uh, horrible odds. Horrible odds. There's, you know what's funny? It doesn't mean it's not a, it's not possible. You know what's funny about right. that? Mm. W when we talk about our career as trainers and, you know, it's hard to make money and it's a hard business. And if 30% of your clients get long-term success, you're, ten, you're way better than most trainers. We paint like a realistic picture. How many times have you heard people say, I left my successful career to become a personal trainer because of what you, because of your show. Yeah. The odds being stacked against us People listening right now who feel this fire that I'm communicating right now, all that does is embolden us. Yeah. I don't want, good, good, I'm glad. The out, odds are stacked against me. That makes me even more angry and yeah. even more on fire. So bring it on. Um, but look, what I'm, what I'm stating is 100% the truth. Every market, you can do, you can go through literally checklist. Every market Go down that list and imagine the change in consumption habits if people felt fit, healthy, and secure. What kind of clothes would people buy? Mm -hmm. or how, would, how would they purchase clothes? Makeup, plastic surgery, medicine, food, homes, um, organizations, education. Like literally, if people went on... By the way, this is not a destination. You're not going to be like, I'm fit, healthy, and cured or whatever. It's just a pursuit. You're moving towards that. It's a growth pursuit. If you, if people kind of wake up a little bit and understand like, okay, this is, this is a very good pursuit. This is the direction I want to move. And they continue to move in this direction and it becomes a movement. Oh my God. Like the, the progress that we would make in every uh, aspect of society is tremendous. So again, the soldiers are the, are the good coaches and trainers that are out there. The people that are out there that are doing this for the right reasons, trying to trying to train people and help people and coach them and simultaneously work on themselves. Because I guarantee you, by the way, the naysayers are going to do this. Here's what the here's what the enemy is going to do. They're going to paint the trainers, the coaches, and the fitness people as hypocrites. Mm -hmm. They're going to say, "Oh, really? Well, look at those insecure bodybuilders. Look at those body obsessed fitness influencers." Yeah, yeah look, we're all human. We're all human. This is a pursuit. This isn't a, it, it, nobody's perfect. Only one person on uh, who's ever lived in the history of mankind uh, was perfect. Nobody's perfect. It's a pursuit. Don't let them. Um, don't let them discourage you by pointing out your imperfections or the imperfections of the people uh, on this pursuit. And they will. There's a lot of money and a lot of power behind trying to um, defeat the message that I'm communicating right now. But it's the truth. Bring it on. It is it is strange how we've seen in the last um you know a couple of years just recently the attack on the health and fitness space, you know, on gyms and gym culture and mm -hmm. it's that's really weird. That's it, it seemed it for a long time it seemed like that's always been a, a just like Leave a, it alone. Yeah, leave non-political. Does it it only helps everybody. They don't have an agenda, you know, it's like mm -hmm. so to see the uh the media kind of come after the gym culture and we're exercising. That's not a lot of things make me get my cackles up and start thinking like you guys and conspiracy theories, but that's, that's really fucking weird to yeah. me. It I, really is. I don't think it's like this organized, by the way, I don't think there's like, like a, like a leader who has meetings with all these. <laughs> no, I, don't I think, think it's just in their best interest, all these markets, all these, it's in their best interest to feed sick and unhealthy, right? Not to feed. You'll lose consumers. If your consumer most markets will lose consumers. They'll have to shift completely. And even if they do, you're going to lose uh, consumers if they become secure, uh, fit, and healthy. Yeah. So it, that's all it is. I'm not. And so when I'm saying the enemy, you know, I know I'm painting like this, like like Sauron, right? The eye. And he's like got all these <laughs> hordes, you know, whatever. And you can picture it that way, and that gets me fired up because I like to think of things that way. But <laughs> the reality is, is it's just in their best interest. And they're all trying to do this. By the way, look look at our space. Again, I'll point to another way that our space gets infiltrated. Look at the division in the fitness space between different factions or styles of fitness. You got your yoga people, your mobility people, your power lifters, your bodybuilders, your crossfitters, your distance runners. And then they all fight with each other. That's human and nature. And argue. That's human nature. Yeah. You know what the funny thing is? Yeah. We're all... 
we're all reality. Like we all join arms. We're yeah. all moving. The we're same all in the same pursuit. I know, I've, I've been thinking about that too. And it's, it's really at this point, if this keeps persisting in terms of like this, this sort of like, um, deliberate, um, misinformation and trying to mischaracterize like the gym culture and the gym itself and make it look like it's this, you know, negative toxic place. Like we really need to rally, uh, these other, uh, different modalities, different camps and different, I mean, we need to like band up and, and, and push back against that and, and, and show only- people it's, it's like, we're unified. It's the only way I think they you can get everybody unified is if there was a concentrated attack on on all of us. Just like I mean, if you could go back hundreds, go back thousands of years, uh, it, we would naturally make our own tribes. Yeah, we wouldn't give a shit about what the the, the things that the tribe down the down the road were doing, unless there was a concentrated attack on all of us. Yeah, that would force us to unify and and fight. So I feel like that's the only way that this happens is one, everybody kind of wakes up and sees what's happening yeah. and agrees that it's a concentrated attack on healthy people, yeah. on trying to keep us uh, unfit um, and sick and dependent, and, and dependent yeah. on help and support. This isn't know? conspiracy theory. It's like you got to look back and see like all of these uh, measures that were stacked against like us having good health. Like it, it was just, it was from all different angles. And so to, to, to be honest with ourselves and, and to realize the reality of what we're facing, it's a real thing. It's, it's not, it's not conspiracy. It's so ta- It's so hard because, um, one, what we're selling is, is much tougher to sell. And the, the other side has gotten so good at, selling and presenting their message is virtuous too. That's and, and I'll give an example of like so good. Mm-hmm. Something that I was getting into somebody with about um you know I did you see that um I don't even know how the, I didn't know how the, the Supreme Court could throw something out and then the the president still come back over it and move Veto forward. It. Yeah he yeah. so he's like moving forward on the relieving the um oh uh, the bailouts of the yeah, the, the school debt, yeah, right? Yeah. And that seems so virtuous, like, oh, I'm a struggling 20-year-old and I've got 80,000 dead and he wants to come save. But you you just don't understand economics at that point. You don't understand that printing a bunch of money and relieving you, because someone has to pay that debt off, right? It's coming from somewhere. It's coming from other taxpayers. It's coming from the government printing money. It's got to come from somewhere. And what you don't even realize is ultimately that's even worse for you. And then right in front of you, it feels like that feels good and you're help, they're helping me, but they're really not helping you. And the reason why they can sell it that way is because when you, and I love using the analogy of like a monopoly board. When I own uh, Boardwalk and Park Place and all the greens and all the reds and then all the rest of you have are distributed all the other properties and you run out of money because I got all the hotels and stuff on there and I win. It looks real virtuous for me to say, "Hey, the bank should help you out and give you guys some more money." Comes right back to you. What do I care? <laughs> yeah, because I know as soon as you keep rolling that dice, it eventually it comes anyway. right back in my pocket. So yeah. I get richer by telling you that I'm trying to help you out by giving money. Yeah. So I look virtuous by doing that. I think that like the, the the pharma does this really well. Government does this really well. And so, you know, we really have to find a way to educate people that a lot of this bullshit that they're being sold is not in their it's, best interest. It's crazy no. because we wouldn't, good parents would never raise their kids this way. Like, imagine you had a kid and they go off to college and now they're trying to get a job and they're like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stay at home and play video games. And then after yeah. a couple months, hey, dad, uh, I need more money. I'm out of money. You're going to be like, yeah, here's more money, buddy. Stay at home and play video games. No, you're going to be like, listen, you need to go out there, make it happen. It's harder. Here's how, and maybe a good dad would say, let me help you. Let me coach you. Let me show you, but you need to take those steps. Right. Versus let me just give you this stuff. Keep you numb. How funny is that? That most, most anybody who's a parent totally gets that analogy and goes like, oh, I would never do that. My kid was sitting here, sitting in his room, eating Cheetos, drinking sodas, and just asking for money. And I just gave it to him whenever I wanted. I would never do that. But yet we turn around and do that in society. Imagine, <laughs> yeah. It, to, put it, right. to, to put it even, make it even more ridiculous. Imagine if that was your kid, and they're like, "Oh, dad, my, you know, my head kind of hurts. Oh, yeah, here's some more, here's some Tylenol, buddy. Have some more Tylenol. Oh, my head even hurts even more. Here, stack some ibuprofen yeah, on top of that. Just do more. Yeah. When you're like, open the window, go outside, yeah. maybe drink some water. Yeah, you know, yeah. let's let's get you to, you know, let's really solve this problem. 
look, here, here's, here's the biggest, here's the, the biggest piece of evidence. What is the default person? If you live in a modern society, you live in America, what's the default? Is it good health or is it poor health? What is normal and average? It's poor health. Yeah. You are actually weird and you stand out and you're not like most people if you're healthy, secure, and fit. That's not the default. The default is don't move, distract yourself, eat garbage, take pharmaceuticals. Oh, got to take more pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Oh, got to keep doing that. You know, oh, shut your mouth. Oh, you're upset. You don't feel good. Here's another pill to kind of numb you. That's the default. So um, it is 100% now, an uphill battle. One of the things you have to keep in mind too is this, because I know a bunch of people are going to hear like your your rant right now and get all fired up, right? And then I'm going to go tell my aunt, my uncle, I'm going to oh, tell my I'm glad you're saying this, yeah. And what you have to understand is that that, that is not the way to do it. The way to, to get your family, to get your friends, to, to get them on board is to, to live it to live it. And if you think you live it right now, live it more, you know, be the example, show people the way, not tell people the way, because if you cannot, if you cannot live that healthy life, that better life, um, and, and attract people to want to ask you questions, you're the likelihood you're going to convert them to do that. Because what they're going to do is they're going to right away default into the things that you're you're a hypocrite about. Oh, you you tell me I need to be doing this. I saw you yeah. eat that ice cream the other day. You're no better than me. So you can't come at it with telling everybody what they need to do or how important it is that we do this. It's you've got to live it and you got to control what you can control, which is yourself, your immediate family and be the example. If you do that and you do that better than you've ever done it before, I promise you'll attract people to ask. We, we look, people know this. The most effective evangelists are the ones that don't sit and preach to you. Yeah. And I don't mean this just in the religious sense. An evangelist is somebody who promotes their idea or their way. And it can be religion, it can be other things. Uh, but the most effective ones are the ones that live a particular way. You notice it. And you go, man, why? God, John is always like, yeah. he's always so in a great mood. Like nothing like pisses him off. He's so productive. He's like a great father. Like, what is his deal? And then you go to John, you're like, John, like, like I got to ask you, like, why, how are you able to do this? He's like, well, you know, I don't know. I think I just, I try to stay healthy and fit. And, you know, I eat a particular way. I notice if I eat it this other way that I kind of feel crappy. And now you're like, wow, okay. Like that makes sense. Versus like John sitting it down. Hey man. You know that donut you had this morning? Yeah. Like, no, cut, pff, walls up, I'm not yeah. listening to you. Yeah. So being the example, imagine if you had this, this small percentage of people called you know, trainers and coaches who were true evangelists, not preaching, not hammering people, not you know obsessed with just how they look and trying to post pictures of how hot and sexy they are because that feeds the wrong thing, but actual real evangelists. Imagine how many people they, they would could truly impact to kind of want to go like, huh, I want to, I want to kind of do what, what this person is doing or figure out why this person is so secure. I've had experiences like that myself. I remember I've told these, I've probably told these stories a few times, at least on the show. There were a couple of times that happened to me as a gym manager. I remember there was a, a man that used to come in, older gentleman, and he, you know, he had gray hair, but very fit, looked really good, always smiling, 5 a.m., shook people's hands, came in, worked out, did his thing, left. And I remember I'd watch, I probably saw him come in 10 times at least. And I thought, man, that 55 year old guy looks incredible, man. I checked him in one day and I scanned him in and I don't remember his name. I don't remember what his name was. We'll just say it's Jack. I'm like, hey, what's up, Jack? And I looked at his, his, his information and I, whoa, 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 Jack, come here. When's your birthday? And he gave me the address, his, his date. I said, you're 71 years old. He goes, yeah, I thought you were 55. He goes, oh, that's funny. He goes, no, I'm, you know, this and that. I've been doing this for so long. And me as a gym manager, still in the middle of my, you know, fitness insecurity, uh, you know, I'm a young, you know, 20 year old kid. What do you think I did? I asked him his advice. Yeah. And what do you think I did? I took it. Yeah. Beca not because he preached to me, because I saw it. I saw this another time with a woman who was working out and, and she looked so amazing. And the female trainer was commenting on how, how great she looked. And same thing. We all thought she was in her 40s and she was in her 60s. And we talked to her about it. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know. I don't use these products and I'm just very consistent and I stick to, you know, whole natural foods. And it was like, man, it was so effective because they lived it. 
So I'm glad you said that, Adam, because um, you're right. You could get we could get a lot of hyped up people right now. Yeah, and shut up, shut down a bunch of. <laughs> I, and then you see, and that's <laughs> just why yelling I, at people's <clears> faces. You know? I mean, I was annoyed this morning. I was I was still logged into the Mind Pump Media IG, and that that thing obviously gets a ton more traction than all of our personal stuff. And you know, I I don't re- I forget how much we're getting tagged and on on so much stuff, and uh, you know, it never fails that there's you know this the the science you know kid who is uh, you know trying to. Pro- promote himself by putting down anything that he can find. And I'm just like, you know, this is, and, and all I, I don't, obviously I don't respond. It's not worth my time to respond to some kid that's, uh, you know, attacking people. And it's just like, you know, who, who are you really trying to help with that type of a message? Like mm-hmm. uh, you to, to be like the, the worst thing that we could all do is to go over to the tribe next door and just start picking hammering them apart yeah, and, yeah. and picking them apart because if the if we agree that this you know what we're trying to do is for the good of everybody, then we need to try and find ways to unify each other uh, instead of uh, hurting each other. It just makes no sense whatsoever. And so, I feel like there's a lot of that in our space. Is you know they feel like they in, in it's necessary for them to get out there or to have a successful business. They need to. Uh, put others down to show how smart they are, and it's just like you, you, you're fighting the wrong fight. Yeah, look at the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the yeah, big you're picture. You're fighting the wrong fight. Everybody needs to start really considering that. You know, like it's it, we're not in a in a position of prosperity like we m- might have been. You know, a few years back, even. Uh, you know, it's a totally different landscape, and and so you know that message in terms of like looking at everybody else's. Um, what they're presenting in terms of facts and what they're presenting in terms of nutrition and, and fitness advice. And you know, if there's little inconsistencies and errors and all that, like we need to look at a lot bigger scope of like how this is actually like shaping your average person that's going to come on and read these comments and read this dialogue between the two. And is it, is it helping them? Is it lifting them up? Is it moving the needle for them in a direction that's closer to health? You got to really like assess that and look at that and, and, and take accountability for that. Yeah, but you know, you, you learn this really well uh, when you train people for a long time. You start to realize that these small details are not as important as, yeah. as you once thought. Yeah. Like meal frequency, you know? Like, you know, I'll be like, well, it's really up to personal preference. Uh, that really is what matters. And then some kid will come out. That's like, what well, he, this study showed that, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's, there's a 3% increase in whatever. It's like, oh, listen, that really doesn't matter. Yeah. If she doesn't like to eat 12 times a day, it doesn't matter <laughs> what your stupid study shows. Yeah. It's not going to, it's not going to help anybody. Yeah. Any, anyway, all right, let's change directions. I read a, uh, an article, Justin, that I think I thought about you immediately. Okay. It's not a cheese article either. Mm. Oh, yeah. okay. It's a music one. Music. They, they did a study. This is this is uh, uh, exceptional. It's pretty awesome. <clears throat> they did a study with children, and they found that children who listened to music, in particular, oh, with uh, math. Yeah, did I you saw see this? that. I did see that. Article. In particular, yeah. uh, we're talking about more <clears throat> more kind of classic instruments. Kids that listen to music did, and whether they listen to the music while studying mm-hmm. or or when they didn't study. The music, the music intervention, they called it intervention, right? Because they had controls, perform better and learn faster in math in particular. Yeah. That's, I mean, so they have a study that yes. basically proves what I've experienced personally. That's what I was yeah. saying. Yeah. Well, and what I think is, is feels kind of obvious since that's probably how we originally passed down information education totally. through song. song. Mm-hmm. And I, I tell you, I've shared this before with you guys. I don't know if on air or not, but my, my uh, cousin mm-hmm. who's homeschooled all of her kids and she was homeschooled, and one of, and one of the curriculums that they go through or they use, they teach m- most of all of history through song, and they start planning it when the kid is like in kindergarten, mm-hmm. and he learns like one little like chorus that's like th- five words, you know, and then he's mm-hmm. repeating, repeating, and then every year they build on the song. By the time they get into high school, it's like a fifteen minute long song that the kids it's they were all in my house. they're all in my house, all different ages, so that they can all sing this whole entire song. And it literally, the song is like like a, a history lesson in 15 minutes. Yeah. And so, and remembering names and dates and specific wars. And, and it's like, whoa, dude. Like, and it's just one song. That one song has has, has their ability to 
see this entire timeline. It's so it's so Isn't, neat to see. Okay, and so because we started out with such like guns blazing and like you know, <laughs> I'm like <laughs> I'm so irritated with our education system. This is another example of something that's massively effective, and we don't teach this in school. No, right? It, it's so frustrating to me. We don't teach kids how to actually learn. Yeah, we just pummel them with things to memorize. Yeah, you know what? You, okay, so yeah, but they don't, you, you, you have to first, people have to understand the origin of our school systems first. And if you understand the origin, then yeah. it makes total sense why we do what we do. It was to create it's workers through, for factories. Right. Yes. By the way, it's the a fact. Child. It is That's a fact. Historical and the, fact the, yes. Rockefeller, yeah. The Rockefellers, they all got together, the, the wealthiest people in the world, and said, Yeah, they well, want technicians. What do we need? We need more. We, yeah, we need more of these people to support these big companies to continue to grow. And so this is what the school said. That's who decided yeah. what the school said. Yeah, you segregate were. them by yeah, age. You exactly. teach them to sit down, memorize things, take orders. I know. So with the with the music, crazy thing, that hasn't been disrupted. But, I know, well, but, but it's, I'm just like ah, like that's so effective, right? Yeah. And, and especially math. I think so. What was in the article? Because for me, it's like uh, music is mathematical, right? It, and, oh, and it's just oh, layered in there, and it's just something that you subconsciously pick. You, you receive it better, like subconsciously. Your intuition is. On point, Justin. So the in this article, they say that math... So the I think one of the reasons why we took music out is because it's not, to the average person, it's not obvious how music can help with uh, other things like math. Because you're like, what, what's the connection? But really the way the brain learns things isn't always so literal. So what music does, and it says in here, music and math have many things in common, like the, like the use of symbols and symmetry. Both subjects require abstract thought and quantitative reasoning. So through the listening and processing of music, you actually improve your brain's ability to have abstract thought and to reason in quantitative ways. That then gets carried over mm. and can be applied to things like math. So it literally, music literally teaches or trains the brain to learn better is wow. what you're doing. It's like you're... It's almost like you're an athlete and it's like back in the day when they would say, oh, strength training is not going to help an athlete because it doesn't look anything like football. What are you doing over here? That looks nothing like football. But what it does is it strengthens the body. A stronger body can then perform the, the skills more effectively. So a stronger brain that has better abilities at this quantitative reasoning and conceptual, you know, being able to put conceptual ideas together, which is math. I mean, that's yeah. what math is. Um, I mean, it, it just makes uh, it easier. It's I mean, cool. I would take it even further and do a study on um, communication and um, look at how uh, if you're if you're really kind of receiving music and understand timing and you understand beats and you understand oh, totally. inflection and you understand like uh, crescendo, all these things that um, make up like a dynamic communication skill and, and like say I'm like having dialogue with somebody knowing when to come in when to kind of back out all this stuff you learn in music because you're interacting with other instruments it's very it, it's very parallel I feel like to a lot of those directions 100% this conversation makes me wish that you guys would have listened to me and fucking kept listening and watching, the, <laughs> watching. I, I, how did he spin because, this into that? because <laughs> you're triggering a conversation that I wanted to have anyways uh, and I Dude, and I've let Adam down so many I times <laughs> guys do let me down with this because it's great conversation. All right, what and did we do? What did we do? It was the quarterback Netflix series. Oh, I yeah. was watching it, bro. So, yeah, but you Hold haven't watched it. Hold on a second. Thing, yeah. so Hold episode on a second. I, shit, I want to watch it. You're the one that want to go out the fire <laughs> and talk about shit. I want to, to roast marshmallows. For the, hey, yes, dude. For the, hey, listen. Yeah, okay, I, like, I give literally, him backstory. You yeah. got to catch, so, bro, you got to catch. The, you gotta, so listen, I got Justin on this a little bit, but what you're what what you you're talking about right now that I wanted to get into that I think is interesting is just a different ways of training right and that he gets in i think episode two they get into like the, the physical like training i was totally getting into it too you yeah you, and you would like you guys would like this there's either aside from the it being a pretty good uh, documentary it's also got some cool training stuff and the, the episode i watched last night they just got into kirk cousins getting into uh how he trains his brain in order and he remember what um um ben greenfield remember the first time you, we saw him hook up and do the hover the Hover the oh uh, with the, your with the, with this thoughts yes oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh. so now when Ben Greenfield did it I kind of like scoffed at it and I went like 
okay, that's a lot of silly work for what you are doing. And not this knock that it doesn't have value. It has value. I see the value. I understand what the, the practice is. And yeah, what learn how to control your brain. Like you stay, it's, it's, what you're doing is... What, learn so, how to focus. I yes, guess, so. exactly. Yeah, what's it, it called? Neural feedback? Or yeah. Something yeah. Like that? Yes. Now, for somebody who is a, a quarterback of an NFL team, where guy you have less than three seconds to get rid of a ball, you have to read plays, you have to know what everybody's job is, like things are yeah. moving at 100 miles an hour, people are hitting you. Like, imagine how important sure. that is for him to be able to stay hyper focused, and it's it's showing and him predictive. in his car training, just sitting there in his in the parking lot, like, and the way his his worked, his is like a, a movie, so it's like um. He's watching like a, a movie on his uh, iPhone, and if his brain starts to slightly get distracted and go somewhere else, the the picture starts to dilute. You can't see the image, and then it forces him to focus his brain back over, and then the image comes oh, wow. really wow. clear. That's, and so this that's whole so cool, right? So he's got stuff moving around him outside in the parking lot, things like that, and he's got to stay hyper focused on this video that he's watching, and it and it allows him it, the way he knows he's not is is by how the picture starts to go away, and then he stays on, and he's like. I've measured with and without it, and like my game when I'm yeah. when I'm better. That sounds massively translatable. Oh God, especially for that. Like when Ben first did it, uh, you know, it's Ben, right? And he does yeah. everything that's like right. biohacking. And I'm like, oh, that's neat. You know, he also, cool. He's also, he's also well, doing coffee enemas. Let's yeah, yeah, right. So I just kind of took it with a grain. But then w watching that make its way to a professional football player who's now uh, applying it and using it to sharpen his ability wow, to stay cool. focused in yeah. like very dist obviously distracted. That's going to be so valuable right. uh, moving forward because everybody's so distracted and we're so like, everything's trying to catch what our a attention. skill. Yeah. That we lost. Yeah. So I, they, they're, they're actually doing studies with that, uh, with ADD, with kids who have ADD. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm really impressed with like the, the stuff that he has personally sought out to do for himself. Like he also went out and hired a, a therapist on his own. That he sits down and after all the has a game, right? He threw an interception or mm -hmm. got took a hard hit and stuff like that. And like he literally does that just to have that communication, get all those thoughts out, have the dialogue, let the and let the therapist tell him, like, okay, listen, like be careful what pathway you're going down with your head of of you start thinking this way and it you 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 lose brain power and focus on these things that are going to propel you to be a better quarterback. So like, and just so watching him have that dial, I'm like, so brilliant. These are things that, again, that I think are so important uh, in life and, and these skills. And you can see, uh, obviously, how that translates into a quarterback like that. And it's neat to see like people seeking outside of the traditional way of yeah. learning and educating ourselves. Well, was it, is it Patrick Mahomes that, um, the open his hips and yeah, his, yeah, yeah. When like they were working on these weird angles and things where he could throw the ball yeah. with his trainer and like it, how they're actually strengthening these awkward positions. So he could throw across field. He could, it, I mean, he already had like natural talent in terms of, uh, his background in baseball. Uh, but you see him do these like really like unconventional throws and, and he makes massive plays as a result of it. And so, yeah, at the highest level, some of these really unique uh, characteristics and attributes, like if they can work on those specifically and get even better, it's, it, you see how that translates. I oh. like the mental training because uh, uh, it, it's, it's pretty obvious to be a high performing athlete. You have to have physical attributes, right? Strong, fast, agile, talent. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't realize, the except for game. people who compete at high levels, the mental game, how important it is. Yeah. Like, uh, there's a lot of people that do very well in practice and then all of a sudden can't seem to perform on game day because of the pressure yep. or what's going on. And then there's other people, like, have you seen, have you, have you seen the studies on like, uh, astronauts and fighter pilots and. Like the more pressure they're under, oh, the, their heart rate. the calmer they get. Yeah. It's yeah. so crazy. I saw they, I saw a really cool thing on I forget was it a doc? I don't remember where I watched it or if I read it. I'm talking about like the Steph Curry's and the the like the your gold medalist in the, you know, aerial skis. Yeah. And you think of these people are going flying down this hill at sixty miles an hour faster, or hit something spinning like yeah. and then they measure their heart rate. It's like, and then just like oh. it's 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 lower <laughs> it's lower than my resting heart rate right now. And like that is so unbelievably important to the success of that. Like yeah. and I've tried things like that and I'm like my heart is racing yeah. out of my chest. Yeah. Knowing that I'm gonna I mean I went wakeboarding last weekend and it's been a long time, right? And, you know, just cutting out the wake and knowing I'm barreling into this thing to, to, to launch it, 
like I'm not calm. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm doing, I do that. it anyways. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, Oh God, here we think go. About what that brain. creates in terms of like tensing of your body, like yeah. uh, what that does physiologically. Like if your heart rate's going super hard, uh, and while you're trying to go through, uh, these, these crazy obstacles and things and versus staying calm and like, you know, how, what kind of movement patterns you have as a result of that versus being stiff and locked oh, and, yeah. you know, so it's just, I mean, there's so many factors to that. The best athletes, athletes in the world are the ones have figured that out how to stay calm under like immense pressure totally you, you know we're talking about training and stuff like that i was just thinking about uh last night having dinner and we're eating you know uh, tri-tip or whatever and we you know there's a big you, you could tell the difference between grass-fed and grain-fed meat and i don't mean like in terms of health or whatever gra you know grass-fed's you know, a better you know better fatty acid profile maybe better nutrients blah 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 but let's be honest, grain fed is fattier and it tastes more like candy. Like you eat, you know, grain fed meat yeah, and yeah. it's like super tasty and palatable, right? Well, my kids, my little ones, especially they've been, uh, for the most part, they eat grass fed for the most part. We've worked with butcher box now for a while. Aurelius is only, what is he? Two and a half. The majority of the meat he's eaten has come, has been, um, uh, grass fed. Like we don't go out to eat very often with him. Parents with little ones know why. Not because we're trying to be <laughs> virtuous, but because it sucks to go yeah. out to dinner with the, <laughs> with the two year old. Suffering. <laughs> yeah, it's like, why don't we do this? Yeah. Every time we do it, by the way, every time we go out to eat with the two year old, yeah. at the end of it, we're always like, uh, why like, did we? Well, why? Yeah, that was a dumb. It wasn't as bad as the last time. Let's not do that. Yeah, yeah, let's not do that again. And then mm -hmm. you forget like three weeks later and try it. Anyway, he eat, that's mainly what he's used to eating and he prefers it. He actually prefers the flavor of grass fed so meat I, I, over okay, grain so fed, what you're, what you're, which is so wow. cool. Be, and that's because he's I mean, used to it. I, you know what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes I think about that a lot when I talk about the way I eat steaks and admitting the same way, like, oh, it's just so much better. And it's like, man, is that because I've trained my palate yeah. to, to, to seek that and I want wonder. that so bad? I mean, I feel like I see that in my son with the way he like treats and that we like, even the, the treats that we've had, like uh, his cookie version is like our, you know, healthy creatures of habit cookies or things yeah, like yeah, that yeah. that we've introduced. And so then when he gets around like foods that are like really sweet, that are like regular traditional cake or candy, it's overwhelming. Even if he ate, he'll bite it and then he's like, good. Or he'll take, and he's like, and he would rather have the one that mom made that's homemade and natural and better for you. A and more so, balanced, yeah. So yeah, I wonder if like wise. the whole steak thing that we always talk about, part of that's He because, prefers it. He yeah. eats yeah. more, yeah. he'll eat more butcher box tri-tip, which is grass fed. Then you will if we go, uh, you know, over someone's house or whatever, and they have the traditional tri-tip, which is obviously fattier and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. In fact, if it like la again last night, you know, when we have like, you know, because you have when you have little kids, sometimes you have these battles over food. You're like, yeah, I want more. I want what, whatever. Mm -hmm. He'll he'll we have to hide the fruit. We literally cannot put all the fruit out because he'll eat the hell out of it. Yeah. That's how much he likes fruit. Like candy, yeah. because his palate is used to, for the most part, whole natural foods. Yeah. Like a little kid would be with with candy. So he eats a, if you put a banana and candy yeah. next to him, he'll probably choose a banana. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the thing that he's associated yeah, yeah. and you know, he's used I to. I think about that a lot, and I wonder if it, if that will continue on as he gets older, you know? You'll get exposed to more. I mean, you know, yeah, my, I mean, my son is definitely, I, I, I you know, for a long time on the show, I told you there. he's never been introduced to sugar. I mean, my son's absolutely had sugar now. Like, he's absolutely had sugar and ice cream, and we've tried yeah. most everything now. But it's cool because uh, I think that we prolonged it as long as we did. Um, now when I introduce it to him, it's not this kicking fight. Like in the way I do it too, like when we're at places, so it doesn't, so I don't look like the awkward dad and son who's like, no, we can't have a cupcake. Sure. You know what I'm saying? And my, and all the kids. Plus are you don't want him to start to notice that. Yeah. Yeah. That so, you know, so him and I will have it together and we'll share it. And you know, it's like, and so I will. I do the same thing. Yeah. So, so my, uh, Aurelius, he will, he'll eat ice cream with me yeah he in fact if i try to give it to him by himself he wants to eat it with me yeah. because that's the way we've always done it so, so i've tried to connect like the you know the that's the how I, that's how i do it and so it's like this wow, it's, we, cool. we share it and then of course i strategically take much bigger bites yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hold on a second not because I'm i helping him not out. because i necessarily want that's more of your it. dad yeah. shut up bro <laughs> you guys are you teaching him about taxation i'm teaching exactly. about taxation yeah, right? bro. <laughs> hold on hold on that's a common thing when how many times have you done that just sweep in oh dad tax when i was a kid and the ice cream man i don't even know the ice cream man even exists anymore i haven't seen one in a long 
long time. Yeah, they won one by my house. They used to go to uh, yeah. like around the fields, it's, dude. That they've they've hacked into the matrix. Okay. Like they know. That, oh, you know like, why kids don't play all the kids? Anymore. Yeah, exactly. That are like at soccer. That's why you they, never see them. They're they show up right <laughs> when everybody's done, just magically. Yeah. yeah so I remember the ice cream man would come by. And then I'd be like, oh, come on, fuck, give me ice cream, whatever. And every once in a while, he'd go, all right, I'll get you some. And he'd buy me like a popsicle or something. And he would always take a bite first. And, and my dad would always literally bite half of it off. <laughs> you know, every time. And I thought as a little kid, that's just what you did. Yeah, yeah. Then I could realize like, what he was doing. He's like, oh, you're trying to get me to eat less ice cream yeah, so you can yeah. enjoy more of it or whatever. It's cool, though, because I think if I was a little kid and my dad was doing that stuff like that, I'd actually, like, throw a fit about it, like, because I wanted it so bad. Where <laughs> It's not like yeah. that for him. It's really it's really cool to see, like, what a, what a difference that is. And then I think the last, speaking of stuff, like, reporting back on our son and things that uh, we're doing, um, you know, we, I've told you before that one of the things we used to allow him to do is do like the iPad, like when he's like around the dinner time yeah. and stuff. And that was like a, a normal thing for him to be able to like play his game or whatever while he's like eating. And we've completely like pulled off. Yeah. You of said that. he's doing those lessons. Right? Yeah. We've switched over to that. And now that's, he doesn't even, again, it's like maybe took three days to a week of us being consistent with those. Be and then now it's, it's like, like you forgot about it. He right? forgot about yeah. it. Like that's what's, what's like really cool about kids is like and i get it as a parent like the initial like oh i'm trying to change this behavior can be a little rough sometimes mm -hmm. but what's crazy is like their 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 memory their memory is so short man they don't you give them a couple of days of consistency like that and they forget and they and then he's now trained to like he just goes over and grabs all his school stuff before he eats and it's no longer a thing you, you know what him. i did that might i don't know if this is a good or bad thing but i did it anyway i introduced uh my son to uh tom and jerry the original <laughs> Tom and Jerry cartoon. So Max, the likes real one, the it, original so Mickey Mouse stuff. Dude. Okay, well at least it's, that's Mickey Mouse. I mean, do you remember yeah, the original Tom oh, and Jerry? Yeah, Tom and Jerry's a little edgy. Bro. Yeah, it's a little edgy. Smoking <laughs> cigarettes and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, dude. Hey, he was dying. It's he, off the chain. There was this one scene where Tom like lit a uh, like a bomb to blow up Jerry, <laughs> yeah. and it blew it and it blew up in his face, yeah. and you know, and he was cracking up. Dude, so, that and the Wiley e. Coyote and the. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Roadrunner. Road Runner, yeah. Like, yeah, it's just all those are so funny to look back and be like, wow, that was like insanely oh, violent. Man. We were, him and I were dying of laughter. There was this one where, and these are, by the way, they were made in the 40s. You guys know that? These Tom and Jerry cartoons in the 40s, yeah, 40s wow. and 50s. We were watching one where there was this babysitter uh, who's watching a baby. And it's like, you can tell it's like the 50s because she's got the dress on and the, you know, she's on the phone talking to her friends and the baby keeps crawling out of the crib and getting into crazy shit. And Tom and Jerry always saving the baby, mm -hmm. but they're the ones getting into trouble because they're always near the baby. Mm -hmm. He was oh, he was laughing so hard, bro. Him and I were dying watching that. So, I don't know. I guess it's a good thing. <laughs> we're having a good time. We're having a good time. <laughs> yeah, anyway, at, at the beginning of this, we were talking about kind of like purpose and meaning and stuff. And, and, you know, we're supposed to talk about um, Organifi today. And I will say this, of, of, of all the companies we work with, they're one of the most uh, purpose-driven companies companies that i think i've ever worked with yeah when you talk with the founder yeah, yeah. Uh, when you talk to drew oh, yeah. like he isn't just a business owner um he actually he really you could you really sense and feel like he really believves in the mission of of their company yeah it's actually what sold us what sold us on working well, with they always go company. that extra measure to make sure like the quality is always under check and, and control and like it's one of the only companies i know that's really like putting out there the glyphosate residue free. residue free yep. uh even the, before the market demands it before yeah, yeah before anybody else did that I, I mean i i really like him i know we've teased a, a little bit for being a little woo woo or cuckoo <laughs> or like he's a little he's a little different he's a little fancy with his outfits i've always, always yeah, liked him it. like we i, mean, I like we, it was from the day we met we've he's always a real dude. stayed in yeah. contact and are, are texting back and forth yep. and you know, I don't know how many people know, but he, you know, one of the things too, I had a lot of respect for him to do. Like, I don't know if I could do this, right? Like if, you know, we scaled this thing to, let's say, you know, 5X bigger than what it is, because that's probably about when he did this. And, um, you know, and I know that I was largely responsible to, of doing that with the three of you guys. And then uh, to go, you know what, I'm going to step down and out and allow some stranger to come in and now run you know, my company or our company, like that takes a lot to be, that takes a lot of humility and it takes a special character to be able it's to true. do that. And he did that. And then to see what he's doing now 
to step back in when you see your child may not be getting raised exactly the way you want to, which I think is also cool. Like, so the humility it took for him to step back, allow that thing to others to come in and scale it beyond maybe his experience and knowledge with building a company and then, and it to continue to grow and have all kinds of success and then kind of go like, Oh, wait a second. Wait a things minute. are bring it back to the original mission. Yeah, right? like yeah. So, I love, that's why every time we talk to him, when he talks about supplements and their products, he always talks about quality. He always talks about sourcing. He always talks about clean. Like it's never like we can make the margins bigger here and we right. can do this with that. It's always like, so it makes me feel good. You know, that's again, that's how they sold us when we first started working with them. Yeah. yeah. yeah good no, stuff. I tell you what, I mean, there's uh does he have an Instagram? I was just going to say, there's he a does. shout out for the day is uh follow, follow Drew. So I think he's, uh, I think is it, what's his Instagram? Is it Drew Cannoli? Yeah, Drew Cannoli. Uh, it's D R E W C A N O L E. There you go. Shout yeah, out to Drew. We love you, buddy. Out. Yeah. I got something for you guys. Oh, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you've heard us talk about the benefits of good sleep. There's almost nothing it won't improve. Helps you build more muscle, burn more body fat, be in a better mood, have less cravings. One of the most effective things you can do to get yourself better sleep is to work with a company called Eight Sleep. Now, this goes over your bed, and is controlled by artificial intelligence. No joke. It will control the temperature of your bed, and it measures things about you, like your sleep phases, your comfort preferences, environmental conditions, to maximize your sleep as an individual. This is one of the best sleep technologies I've ever seen. It's phenomenal. Go check them out. By the way, they ship not just to the U.S., but also to Canada and the UK, and even some countries in uh, the EU. Oh, Australia as well. Go check them out. Go to 8sleep, so that's spell it out, 8sleep.com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump 10 and get $150 off the pod cover. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Jonathan from Maine. John, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast since 2017. I haven't missed a single episode, so it's a real honor and privilege to be able to speak with you today. So thank you for taking my call. Wow, hey. appreciate the support. Thank you. Uh, so my question today is regarding how to stay fit year-round. Uh, so I've been working out since the seventh grade. I got a long history of playing football. Uh, always been super into weightlifting, you know, but as I got older, I kind of ran into that issue of not having a lot of time specifically, you know, I work about 11 and a half hour days, including a commute. Uh, the way my personality works is I'm either all in or I have a hard time focusing and staying consistent. I'm also in the army national guard and every October we have a PT test and height and weight, uh, where they measure our weight and body fat to see if we pass, uh, what I have been doing the past few years, uh, uh is a few months leading up. Uh, to the month of that of those tests, I usually go super sober. I don't drink for a few months, and I go wicked hard on diet and training, uh, so that I can pass. And I don't usually have a problem doing that. Uh, but what I I find that happens is uh, about a month after the test is over, I kind of go back into you know grabbing drinks with the friends, uh, having wings and and beer, uh, watching like Patriots games, uh, and then I I kind of make more excuses why I can't make it to the gym. Uh, even when I uh, cut and lose a lot of weight, I'm still not super comfortable with my body and I know I need to do better, but I struggle finding that magic spot where I can continue to do fun things with my friends and also work out. Uh, and I think it is because I have to be, like I said before, all in or all out. Um, I just feel like it's a waste of time working out if I'm not dialed in 100%. I am just concerned uh, I am going to continue down this path and be unable to lose the weight anymore. Uh, when I wrote this email, I said my wife and I were trying for a kid. We just found out, actually, she's, she's eight weeks pregnant. Oh, hey, uh, so congratulations. I, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so I, I want to uh, be a good role model, set a good example for, for my kid to, to follow along. Uh, so just looking for just some, uh, some lifestyle, uh, living a uh, healthy lifestyle, some tips regarding that, um, you know, when you, if, if you have lulls in your fitness, when do you do, when, when do you usually have those and how do you stay on track? How do you convince yourself to mostly do the right things, diet and exercise wise, when you aren't all in and when do you take the time, uh, when you do take time away, how do you get yourself back into it? 
what are your larger purposes in maintaining the healthy lifestyle? Yeah, this is, mm-hmm. so this is a great question because there's a lot of people, I know there's a lot of people listening right now that can relate, relate to what relatable, you're saying. Yeah, yeah. By sure. the way, congratulations again on, on having another Thank baby. You. It's phenomenal. All right, so this is actually easy, John. And I don't mean uh, easy in the sense that, um, well, it is once you change how you frame this, okay? There's nothing wrong. You have to let me finish because at first it's going to sound crazy, but there's nothing wrong with the all-in, all-out mentality. What's wrong with it is what you consider to be all-in, okay? So if what you consider to be all-in is unsustainable, especially when you have other priorities as a man, as a husband, as a father, somebody with responsibilities. Um, if that if that all in doesn't change, well, then you're always going to be playing this game of, well, I got to take from here to give to there. And then now this is more important than that. And it's going to be this up and down kind of seesaw effect. Now, if you change the definition of all in, then you're going to be perfectly fine, John. So uh, to give you an example, okay, all in for you now may mean a daily 20-minute workout. That's what all in might mean for you right now. By the way, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's uh, it's many, many, many times more effective than nothing. And it's also more effective than doing a lot of workouts and a lot of diet a few months out of the year and then doing nothing or being sporadic. It's just more effective all the way around. So you have to change the definition of what all in means to you. Also with diet, uh, you know, all in at one point might have meant something completely different. Now it might simply mean this. I'm going to avoid heavily processed foods and I'm going to make sure that every meal that I eat has about 40 grams of protein. Okay. That might be all in for you now. Before it might have been much more specific and dialed and planned out and all that other stuff. And then lastly, I want to add this part. This is a little bit more of a kind of big picture um, thing is that your workouts and your diet, your nutrition should improve the rest of your life. They should not feel like they're taking away from the rest of your life. In other words, when I hear people say things like, oh, you know, but then I want to enjoy my time with my family or my friends they're playing the wrong, they have the wrong understanding of what uh, exercise and diet uh, is all about. Really what it should do is it should improve those things for you. So that doesn't mean you have necessarily more time. Obviously, you're a married man with you know, children, but um, your workout and diet should make everything else better. So look at the rest of your life. What are your top priorities? What's probably your, your wife, your kid, your job, your service. Okay, so what am I workout and diet? How, how should they look? in a way to where it makes everything else uh, feel much better, be much more enjoyable. What does all in mean for me now? And then also have the flexibility to realize that that's going to change later as well. It's always going to change. That's the whole point. I like how you frame that uh, with the all in concept. The only thing I'll add to that, since that was very long winded and so I gave you all the advice, Justin, and I probably could have given you there. It was great advice. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks guys. But, uh, we'll talk to you later, John. What, what I will add, <laughs> uh, it, and because I can relate to this feeling, uh, and also, uh, being a big football fan with my buddies and loving to watch, I mean, every game on Sunday, that's definitely, uh, my lifestyle and has been my lifestyle for a long time. And you've probably heard this because you've been listening since 2016. Uh, This is where the win the weekend thing happened for me. And I don't know if you've experienced this or you can relate to this, but there is a total different feeling I have sitting down, having a beer and a couple slices of pizza with my buddies when I slept in until kickoff at 10 versus when I got up and I went and got a workout in before the football and the day started. Uh, Not only do I physically feel better about enjoying that pizza and that beer, um, but I also mentally feel better that like, hey, I, I went and accomplished my workout and therefore I, I'm going to enjoy this beer and pizza with my, my buddies for the, for the game. And then I'll be right back on my, my A game starting Monday. And when I did that, uh, one, a lot of times I wouldn't even be craving that pizza and beer and I'd have less of it or I'd have something else instead of it because I felt so good because I got up and worked out. Other times I would say, fuck it, I'm going to have the beer and the pizza. That sounds good today. And I would enjoy it and I would feel good about enjoying it because I got that lift in. So the only thing I would add to all the great, great advice that Sal gave is that I also would shift my my uh, my thought in, into uh, winning the weekends because I know I enjoy those things 
uh, with my friends. I'm going to do that on Sunday. And so simply by making a conscious effort to get up and get my workout in before I decide to sit around and watch football all day would make me feel so much better about being able to do those things. And again, what I found was many times it was easier for me to pass on that. I'd be like, ah, you know what? I'll have a beer, but I'll also end up having my, my chicken and rice that I already prepped for myself yesterday, you know, or like I found myself making that decision, not feeling like I was sacrificing to do that. It's because I wanted to do it because I was winning the weekend. So that's the only thing I would add to everything. Salvin. Yeah. Do you have uh, our maps 15 program? By chance? Uh, uh, yes, sir. I have all your guys' programs. I bought them throughout the year just to show support for the podcast outside awesome. of sharing it. So awesome. Um, yeah. Yep, I have all, all the programs. So, yeah, just, you know, kind of piggybacking on, on Sal's advice. It's, it really is the, the, the best sort of hack that, um, we've, we've all experienced ourselves, but like even before we wrote that program and had a lot of people kind of calling in with the same type of, um, you know, situation where it's like all of a sudden like work shifts, your environment shifts. Um, you, you feel like you can't really get a real quality workout in like consistently. Um, this is one of those, I used to have like maybe two to three compound lifts, like in my back pocket that I would just focus on those for the day. If I knew like my whole day is getting away from me, I can at least do this like 15, 20 minute, uh, type of workout, just focus on these two things that are going to move the needle. So we just sort of like tried to, to deconstruct that, figure it out, like make it packageable. So it was like an easy thing to follow, but it's always in your, it's always in your pocket. So, uh, I, the biggest takeaway from it was really just the consistency factor. So your body, when it's in movement, it wants to stay in movement. Once you really start to kind of take that away and, and go for those bigger, more intense, you know, long-winded workouts, uh, your, your body's natural tendency is to, to want to kind of, you know, heal, recover, and you might need a little longer to recover and to, uh, just consistently get those like bite those shorter workout bouts. Um, it, it really does, uh, provide a lot of momentum for you to carry on even when you're not as motivated. And on that note, there's many times when I've fallen off for a couple of weeks or whatever, and I'm getting back in the swing of things and even maps 15, like, Oh, I'm making excuses why I don't have time. or I'm not going to do it. And sometimes I just need to go, I'm going to just go squat three sets and see how I feel afterwards. And if I feel good afterwards, I'll do the other thing that's on MAPS 15. But if I bare minimum do that, I'll at least feel like I'm moving the needle in the right direction and I'm not going backwards. So be okay with that, uh, especially becoming a father and and having children running around and stuff like that. In addition to grinding the hours that you're grinding, sometimes it's okay just to get three or four sets of squats or deadlifts or an overhead press in and that's it. You know, yep. if just, just that. that okay. Doing that is not, I used to think, that was a waste of time or useless, or it's not make it's not moving the needle. It is moving the needle a lot more than you think it is, especially when you compare it to the opposite of what you would do if you didn't do that. Yeah, John, there's a, uh, this is really common. Um, we tend to make the comparison an ideal that doesn't really exist versus reality. We don't make a we don't create a real comparison. Like, what's the real comparison? The real comparison is what you're doing now versus 15 to 20 minutes a day, which one's better, right? Not, this is what a perfect scenario would look like. This is what life would look like if everything, if I did every damn thing I could and I went to bed on time and every all the pieces fell where they should and my diet was, like that doesn't exist. So the reality is what we're advising is gonna give you the best results, period, end of story. By the way, the data on this, for anybody who's listening, who's like, uh, oh, well, how, how much can you possibly accomplish doing this? Not just a lot, you you can accomplish more than a lot. In fact, uh, there's studies that show that taking a week off once every four weeks, a whole week off every four weeks results in the same strength and muscle gains at the end of this, what was a 16 or 24 week study that they did. And I've seen some others that show this. You've worked out so long that you've got a great deal of muscle memory. So I would just literally MAPS 15, that's it. Just start there and then loose guidelines with diet. That's mm. it. And then just be consistent mm. with it and then watch what happens. I think you'll be blown away by the progress that you have. In fact, it's going to kind of feel easy. And that's yeah. the point. The point is it should feel kind of easy. Uh, so I get uh, I get three hours a week to work out through my job. Um, I've been I've been messing around with anabolic. Should I discontinue that and, and go over to 15 or... Or since I get those three hours uh, a week where I can do the full body, should no, I stick with that? Here, or? Here's why I'm going to say, here's why I'm going to say, don't, 
because you haven't been. That's right. H how long have you been getting the three hours a week? <laughs> uh, I, I have been working out. I, I ha It's the diet part that I struggle with the most, sir. Yeah. So how long have you been consistent working out three days a week? Like how, how many weeks have you strung together consistently? Uh, I, uh, I, I do. I, I've been pretty, pretty consistent. Like I said, cause I get the time during the middle of the day. So I, I hit it pretty much every week now for the past couple of months. It's just, uh, like I said, it's kind of like the processed foods and, and the beer and stuff when I get home that, that probably harms me the most. Okay. When, well, yeah. I mean, that's most people. I, when same, the weekend, same advice. Bro. When the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> when, the, when the weekend. Dude. I, yeah. think, okay. I think that will make a, a, a big difference for you. Yes. Yeah, same advice. Like um, uh, you literally give yourself like one or two very rough guidelines that you kind of stick to and then okay. everything else is okay. And then just stick with okay. that. Yeah, it's not. You're not going to be perfect. Okay. There's, perfect doesn't exist. So, and that's when we tend to screw up because what, what happens is, is, look, psychologically, it's what happens. We create an ideal. You don't hit that ideal, so it's like, why, why, why try it all? Yeah. Why? What's the point if I didn't hit this perfect ideal? Well, God, that screws us up for everything, doesn't it? That's like that's like the lesson of life. So, I would give yourself like one or two basic guidelines. Don't worry about anything else. And then watch what happens. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. You will slowly progress towards the positive. But just give yourself one or two things that you stick to, and that's it. Just start there. Okay. Thank you. You got it. All right, man. Thanks man. for calling in, John. Thank you. Have a nice day. No problem, man. Yeah, he made it sound like his workouts weren't consistent either at first. I yeah. Was consistent. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 this really applies to anybody in any of the situation where I remember when I was writing um, the book, I, I thought, my God, I got to write this chapter on this day or whatever. And then I talked to our friend, Mike Matthews. He goes, no, what are you doing, bro? He goes, just give yourself 45 minutes a day. Sit down. That's it. Mm -hmm. 45 minutes a day. You write one sentence. No, write no commitment other there. That's just, it. Just be there. And it works. Yeah, it yeah. does work. It works. You take, it's like, it's like I want to walk 20 miles. What do I got to do? You take mm -hmm. a step every day or whatever. You know, that's all you got to do. Yeah, I just, I mean, I look at it almost as if like you're, you're, elevating your baseline so in terms of like uh, yes i'm getting i'm getting workouts in before that but they're a little bit more inconsistent so my baseline is like zero in comparison to like now yeah. every day if at least i do something like I'm, I'm continuously elevating my baseline up and and two like what we know about training is like it's all about the right dose and to be in you know a lower uh, amount of intensity you know maybe a little, little lower volume see how your body responds to that you might actually like uh, uh, improve even more i, I think you would uh, we are getting a little long-winded and that was kind of more information at the very end that I could, probably could have, we went, could have went down another rabbit hole with him with nutrition because one of the things that he said at the very beginning that, you know, struck me was that he's, he's also grinding like 11 hours a day of yeah. work. So there's a good chance that he's not getting optimal sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's probably kicking up the cravings and making the challenge. It may even more challenging for him to sure. be better on his diet. And then you add, you know, he gets his hour, but then he's probably exhausted and he still pushes through the hour like that. Like, He'd probably be better off scaling back to the MAPS 15, like your suggestion, and sticking to that, giving himself some better diet parameters, focusing more on sleep and getting better sleep quality. And then, like I said, I really think that winning the weekend with someone like this, like that's kind of what happened. You grind hard all week. And so and then you all of a sudden just like, oh, yeah. And then you, around. yeah, then you go, oh, fuck it on the weekend. And, and I, I swear, when I gave myself that freedom of I could have the pizza and beer at football because I'm going to sit around, I'm going to watch football from fucking 10 till seven o'clock at night and maybe not move from my couch twice. If I get up and I go to the gym at eight or nine and I get a good workout in th the way I feel throughout that entire day, Your of doing that, change, they? they totally change. Yeah. And I, and I, and sometimes I still would enjoy the food, but many times what I found was like, man, I feel good even sitting around watching football because I did the workout that promoted me to make better choices. And I didn't feel like I had that, that, that constraint of, I can't, so I think that's yeah. a big, a, a big win. You know, what also reminds that. me of this is that when we heard, uh, I think it was Jordan Peterson talk about how, who, you know, parents or fathers in, in particular will plan this like extravagant vacation mm. so they can connect with their family. Make the, win the small ones. Yeah. And he's like, you know, the, the 10 minutes that you say good morning to your kids every day adds up way more than the one or two vacations. So it's that little consistency every day that makes the biggest impact. It's the same thing with fitness. Our next caller is John from California. John, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, um, big fan of the show. Uh, real quick, I'm, I'm actually a new trainer. I've uh, been training for a couple of years and um, 
you guys have been like teaching me along the way because I've struggled to find people in my space that agree with our line of thinking. I actually met you guys because um, my fiance, I started training her, put her in a high protein diet, right? And of course, everybody starts saying, you're going to get fat, you're going to get fat. Searched up on Google, personal trainers talking about high protein diets, found Mind Pump. So thanks guys for all your help. Anyway, I'm going to get on with my question. Um, particularly talking about like reverse dieting. Um, I come from a very overweight past. I was 236 in high school, didn't play any sports at, um, five, eight and dropped about 50 pounds over one summer. I was eating around 1200 calories and such. And anyway, fast forward, uh, I stayed eating around 1500 calories for about five years. And then I hired me a personal trainer and we got through this plateau or whatever for about eight months of a cut, doing a lot of cardio, finally saw my abs and um, decided to finally bulk. And I bulked and then I tried to cut again, got injured, gained a bunch of weight, uh, bulked again throughout that process. And now I'm basically struggling to cut again. So I did a reverse diet. I went through uh, about a two and a half month cut and only lost about five pounds. I'm actually looking back right now, uh, it looks like I lost four pounds and I've been working out for a while. So I know like, I know like I could have put on muscle at the same time, but at the same time it was like, I felt like I was at a high enough body fat percentage. It would have been a little bit quicker. And it made me wonder if like there could have been some damage and I should have stayed in a longer bulk. Um, and if that would have benefited me. And that would also translate to my next question. Is there a point for where it's better to just go ahead and start, like try to do like a harder cut or hold at a longer bulk? Um, to help with your metabolic rate, particularly in more obese clients of mine that need to lose weight very quickly, is it better for them to just hold at it like a long uh, bulk of eating a lot of food, healthy food, strength training, or is it best to try to get that weight off as quickly as possible for health reasons? So anyway, that's my two questions. Uh, I can elaborate as you guys need. Don't think of it as you're, you broke or there's something wrong with your metabolism. Um, you ate low calorie for five years consistently, and I don't know how long you reverse dieted, but you got to understand that the body adapted to that. Uh, that looks that long period of time is such a low calorie, and it, it doesn't sound like your reverse diet or your calorie surplus time has been anywhere near as long as you've been in a cut. And so, I think, yeah, I definitely. Think, I think your body is just more used to a very low calorie diet, and and so you tend to put on body fat pretty quick when you fall off the training, and then add some calories in there. From the sounds of it, I I would probably focus more on the continued reverse diet. I think that trying to build muscle on you is going to be more beneficial than trying to get you in a cut right now and get lean. I think you where I mean, where are you cutting your calories? When you say you cut your calories, where do you cut them now? Uh, yeah, so I, I keep my protein at around a gram per pound of body weight. And then my calories, I'm usually cutting from carbs, but I keep my fats at around 25% of my caloric intake. Yeah, give me your calories though. What's your total calories you're eating? Okay, so um, I'm actually eating the most I've ever eaten ever. Right now is at 2,500 calories. Oh, okay. And then, like I said, I'm broken down at about uh, 190 grams of protein. And then I'm splitting my fats at 25% fat. And then carbs filling in with the rest. Now, are you considering that your reverse diet? Or are you considering that your cut? What do you, because you said you were. That's, yeah, that's the reverse diet. So oh. um, that's the most I've eaten. I went up to that point with the reverse diet because I, I don't know like how long you're supposed to reverse diet. And like I said, eating just over 2000 calories for me has always been like a fear of mine because like I'm scared to death of that weight going up because I've always wanted to be small. So how did you get from, because the last I heard, I, I heard a, a 1,500 calorie or less cut, and then now I'm hearing 2,500 calories in reverse diet. How did you get from 1,500 to 2,500? Did you just leap to 2,500, or did you incrementally move up there? Right, good question. So um, I did the, I did a cut for, for a period, right? And then I just went straight to a bulk. That's what my trainer told me to do at the time. And I wasn't calculating with him at the time. When I started calculating everything, I was eating maybe around 1,800 comfortably. And then I spent six weeks and reverse dieted up to 2,500 and then tried to do a cut again. And there's the results. Yeah. So there's so two things I want to address uh, with kind of what your question 
you know, your question and kind of what you're experiencing. So there's two things to consider when we're looking at uh, metabolic rate, reverse dieting, bulking, and cutting. One is the physiological effects that happen to the body that we try to explain. And I say try because it's very complicated. It's very complex and it's quite individual. Um, now what I mean by that is you can reverse diet some people and they can go significantly higher than what they were, they were before. And other people seem to be their, their bodies seem to be for lack of a better term, more stubborn, I guess, or it take it takes a little bit longer. Now, what determines that? I mean, your guess is as good as mine. You know, it could be, you know, all kinds of different genetic factors. Does your body have a memory in terms of its calories before? What's the mental state? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Honestly, it doesn't matter. This The other half is what matters most, which is the behavioral effects. You asked the question, you said, is it better to cut somebody really fast right out the gates? Now, I can make the the argument, physiological argument that it's better to have them build muscle for their metabolism. Somebody else could maybe make an argument for the opposite. Well, they need to lose a lot of weight because they're so obese. Really, here's why I don't cut people so fast right out the gates. The odds that they're going to be able to stick to whatever I just did go down to almost zero. That's what I care most mm -hmm. about as a trainer. I care most about that. I don't care as much about what's more effective physiologically. What The reason why I care about that is, is that going to influence how easy it is going to be for this person to maintain or how sustainable it is going to be for this person. That's what, that's where I look at the physiolo physiology of it all because 1500 to 2,500 calories, you know, if your nutrients are good, I mean, theoretically you could be just as healthy either one. I mean, I can make the argument more calories. You might be a little healthier because you have more fuel, more potential nutrients, but we tend to get stuck in the weeds with all of that. All right. So what's my advice to someone like you, just based off what you're telling me? I think for a long time, what you should focus on, John, is trying to get as strong as possible and then try not to gain or lose any weight at all. That's how, that's what I would do. I would look at the scale, but I don't want to gain much weight and I don't want to lose much weight. I just want to see how strong I can get. Why am I recommending that? I think it's going to help you behaviorally because it's going to get your, your mind off of the fear of the scale or obsession with the scale. I know if you're getting stronger and your body weight isn't changing much, we're probably moving in the right direction anyway. Metabolically speaking, we're probably moving in the right direction as well. Hormonally, we're probably also moving in the right direction. And it's a really, really good mindset to get into for like a year or two. Like if you were a okay. friend of mine or a trainer, I'd be like, hey, for the next two years, just kind of stay the same weight and let's mm -hmm. see how strong you can get. And then your diet uh, should be modified based off of that and your sleep and your recovery and your programming <laughs> should be based off of strength. That's it. And then the scale is just a way to kind of keep things in check because sometimes with strength, we can get carried away and we could just put 50 pounds on the scale because we added five pounds to our bench press. Obviously, that's not necessarily a good trade. Right. But that's about it. I think that's where you should stay. And I bet you at the end of a year or two, you're going to be in a phenomenal position, uh, both mentally with cutting and physiologically with cutting. So again, I can get into the, the weeds with the science, like you probably, your body has a memory and it remembers how you, you know, we can make this argument what you ate before. So it's going to take longer for you. But what'll happen if we focus too long on that, John, is you're going to go through this like frustrating cycle that you're going through now where you start to reverse diet and then you're itching to cut. Okay. When can I cut? When can I cut? And then you cut and you lose like three pounds on the scale. And you're like, ah, oh, what the hell is wrong with my body type of deal? Just get strong. That's all I would have you do right now, especially at your age, your personal trainer. I would say just get strong and don't let your weight fluctuate too much on the scale. Do that for like a year or two. And at the end of that, you're going to be in a much, much better position. Okay. So, and then like regarding like my clients, like whenever I reverse diet them, I'm pretty good at translating to them, like under helping them understand why they need to reverse diet. Um, but like one in particular I can think of, I put her through just like, a four week reverse diet because her, she came to me and she's like, my doctor said I need to lose 20 pounds and she's worried about her liver shutting down and all these other things. And so she's lighter now, but like I told her, this isn't going to last forever. Like you're going to have to reverse diet, go on a period of basically what you just said that I'm afraid to swallow myself. I told her, um, does that translate properly? Like what it, did I make the right decision with that? 
you did, but you also break it down like this. The doctor says you have to lose 20 pounds. Okay, why? Well, mm -hmm. I need an improvement in my blood lipid numbers. Okay, so what you really need, what your doctor's really saying is, we need to improve uh, these numbers with your blood lipids or maybe your liver enzymes. Maybe she has fatty liver you talked about. So, okay, we can do that. We can improve those numbers. And she'll say, well, what about my body weight? I'm going to do this with you in a way to where it's going to stay off. We're going to lose the weight and we're going to keep it off. But initially, the scale is not going to move much because of this, this, and that. However, the most important thing that you said is that you need to improve these numbers uh, for your doctor. And we can do that right now. We can do that right now. You can improve somebody's health by not having them lose a single pound, by singly, simply getting a little stronger, changing their food quality. That will show some improvements. At some point when someone's obese, though, they need to lose the weight, but that's okay because what you're doing is you're setting the stage for something that's sustainable. That's what you're setting the stage for. Yeah, another way to communicate that is just say that the, 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 the doctor is saying we need to do is to lose 20 pounds of fat. I can keep your weight exactly the same and lose 20 pounds of fat. I can, in fact, increase your weight on the scale yeah. by five pounds and lose 20, 20 pounds of fat. And so even though we, you may not see the scale moving, we're moving in the direction that the doctor wants us to move. And I'm, I'm helping you metabolically. We're going to, we're going to build your metabolism along the way of also getting your healthier, like the doctor wants us to do. So I, 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 I've used this example on the podcast before. I never forget when I first said this, I had somebody exactly like you said, a client came in. No, but my doctor said, my doctor said, but my doctor said, and we're having this conversation. I said, really what they're worried about is your triglycerides are worried about these you know, these lipid numbers and say, yeah, but I got to lose, I don't remember what the weight was, 15 or 20 pounds. I said, okay, well, we can do that real fast. Let's cut off your leg. This is, I've used this example before on the podcast. Oh she yeah. Was, and she laughed. I heard that. Like, well, that's not going to, I said, well, you keep talking about weight. Let's just cut your leg off. The weight's gone. I said, well, okay, obviously it's something else we're looking at. So that's all, that's your job as a trainer is to reframe things and educate this uh, particular person. Because does the doctor care? so much about the weight on the scale if everything else looks amazing, I don't think they're going to care as much. And they might still care because there's still some some stuff there, but that's really what the alarm is coming from, is, is the doctor probably saw some numbers in her blood panel that made him say something like, you need to lose 20 pounds right now. Okay, that gotcha. Yeah, that's very helpful information. Sounds like just something else I just, I just need to adventure and learn more about because I wouldn't have even known to ask that question. Yeah, John, right, do you have cool. do you have mass power lift? Um, no, no, I don't. Yeah, why don't you follow that program? Let's get you real strong. Yeah. Okay, now yeah. you're a personal trainer. Do you have Mass Prime Pro? Uh, I'm gonna throw you. I do. I do. Oh, I do have okay. that. Yes. Yeah, a good man. Saving yeah, and I, right there. I, I will say, I was I was expecting y'all to tell me to to eat and just focus on getting strong because I've never done that. I was not oh. expecting Mass Power Lift, but okay. Yeah, that'll do. You'll Just have the ultimate the focus on just strength, man. Yeah. It'll be good for you. Yeah, well, You'll enjoy it. All right. Appreciate you guys. Thanks for all the help and all that you guys are doing. You guys are educating me every day. Awesome. You got it. Thanks, yeah. John. Yeah, that uh, especially when you take someone that young, you have them focus on getting stronger. Mm -hmm. They get leaner on accident. That's always my favorite. Oh, I'm getting leaner. What the hell's going on? So, yeah. I stopped trying to get leaner <laughs> based on what he was describing the whole time. I could tell, yeah, that that hasn't been a focus of his. You know that that's been like his his composition and uh, you know being able to kind of present himself, which is important. I mean, trainers, I, I do think they need to consider making sure they look like they're fit and in shape. But uh, to to be able to go through just a pure strength focus, you look and and see how that just automatically um, gives you the results you're looking Absolutely. for. Absolutely. It's the, it, it, the hardest part is the psychological part Always. Yeah, because it's a slow process. Totally. It's the better way. It's technically actually the faster way, but psychologically, when you know, you want to lose a certain weight or you have this ideal weight that you want to weigh on the scale yeah. and you know, your coach or your trainer, we tell you, you know, Hey, you don't want the scale to move and we're going to, you know, slowly increase calories, focus, getting on strong. Like, <laughs> That is the best way, probably the fastest way and the healthiest way, the most sustainable way. Mm -hmm. But psychologically, it messes with your head when you, you know, you work real hard all week long, you get back on the yeah. scale and you see it staying exactly the same. Yep. And 
when it's those early first few weeks, uh, you, there, there's not a lot. An awkward transition with it. And I tell you that one of my favorite things uh, about competing and, and and actually having to track this stuff so diligently, the best thing I got from that to to average normal people was, wow, how much water, carbohydrate, uh, bad sleep, a food that you, yeah. like how much, like one choice, right? I could eat, I could eat something that's in my calorie budget. Like, let's say my, I, I made it to where my burgers in my calorie budget, but because the, the cheese and the bun fucks with my gut, all of a sudden, uh, later on that night and the next day, I'm holding on to a little extra water and, and, and in the mirror, I look fat, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, or fatter than I did the three or four days before. And then you go, Oh fuck, yeah. I'm going, the, I'm going the wrong way yeah. or all oh, I'm, you I'm know. skipping four meals. Yeah. And yeah. so then you, then you, and then you overcorrect the other direction and, and restrict way hard calories or you get on the cardio machine. Like, and so, yeah, the psychological part is the hardest part about, you know, unfortunately doing it the right way. You know, way. what's funny too, just for trainers listening, I know you guys went through the exact same process. You know, it's like you're, you're walking into, it's, this is what it's like for a client. It's like you're walking, it's pitch black and there's a cave in front of you and you can kind of see that there's a cave, but you don't know what's going on. And then you got to pick a guide to walk you through. The guide you're going to follow is the one that seems super confident. Like, I know it's scary. Follow me. We're going this way. I'm following that guy. He knows where he's going. It, it's little, the way I used to communicate to my clients at the towards the end of my career. I didn't have to go through so many explanations. Yeah, I literally was like, "Look, I know what you want to yeah. do. This yeah. is how we're going to do." Been it. here before, and the and the client would just follow because of my confidence. I think sometimes trainers they're not confident when they're explaining what's going on because I got to go. Oh, it's the, it's it the takes reps for some people. It for does. Sure. I'm going to call it the ladder roll. It's the ladder roll now. You know, where you walk in carrying a ladder with your buddy. You can <laughs> just get in anyway. As you walk in with that confidence, like we're here to change the light bulbs. Yeah, that's that's shit. Okay. Works. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Try it out, you guys. <laughs> Our next caller is Aaron from Alabama. Aaron, what's happening? How can we help you? Oh, uh, uh, I just can't believe I'm on here. This is crazy. Um, I'm a huge fan. I've been I've been listening since about uh, 2016, episode 400 or so. I wow. think. Wow! Hell yeah! Wow! Uh, uh, anyway, an introduction about me. I'm six one, about 250 pounds. I'm running anabolic with my wife. <clears throat> I have one more week before I go in, or sorry, one more day before I go into phase three. <clears throat> since getting back into the gym. Nine weeks ago, I decided to focus on my protein targets <clears throat> and not calories. I've gotten significantly stronger and have fluctuated up and down about five pounds. So basically, I haven't changed much, I would say. That's probably water or whatever. <clears throat> um, but I wanted to tell you guys a story from my past about MAPS Anabolic, if you guys have time. We do. Oh, yeah, let's hear it. <clears throat> okay. Um, in late 2017, after I started listening to you guys, about a year later, I started uh, MAPS Anabolic, um, and I ran all the way through it once, and I think I was going through it a second time when I went. I had a horrible accident at my job. I fell 26 feet off of a ladder. Whoa. <clears throat> Luckily, I landed on my feet. However, I did break three vertebrae in the process and two wrist bones. This obviously took me out of the gym for a few months. I had to do physical therapy for my back and my wrist before I could go back to work. Then I had to pass a type of stress test with my physical therapist to prove that my body could handle a full day's work <clears throat> before I could go back. Um, to, uh, the test was about two hours long. Long story short, part of the test had me lift a wooden box um, with weights in it, kind of like a deadlift. After about six times telling him I needed him to put more weight in the box, he finally told me that he believed me and was astonished that I could lift as much as I lifted. Uh, even though I just broke my back four months prior, I ended up stopping around 175, 200 pounds. Uh, he said he'd He'd never seen anybody lift that much after that injury. So I, I think anabolic for giving me that back strength to uh, uh, <laughs> uh, awesome. kind of brag about it in that yeah, sense. That's, that's, that's great, man. That's, that's awesome. Story, dude. 
Anyway, uh, on to my first question, uh, and I think I may be the first listener to ask a question about disc golf. Uh, sorry, sorry, Justin. I know your dog uh, got oh, sick on yeah. the course. Yeah, got a, little, um, got a little crazy there. <laughs> um, I can assure you we're not all uh, uh, not all bunch of stoners. <laughs> yeah, we're not all that. It's okay, man. <laughs> it's uh, fun. Anyway, I was wondering what kind of rotational – exercises I could do to become more explosive in a backhand type throwing motion. It's similar to a baseball swing sort of I actually linked uh, a slow motion video in my email. If they, if they want to pull it up, they could fast forward to about 22 seconds in if they did. Um, and you would have an idea of what the motion is like. I was wondering what I could do to strengthen those Obviously, I know the best thing you can do is just get reps in with the throw itself, mm -hmm. but I'd like to know how I could boost that in the gym. Wow. That's all. Well, first off, a great story, man. I'm glad you got better uh, as quickly <laughs> as you did. That's that's exceptional. Okay. So here's what's interesting about um, being able to generate power in a particular direction, whether it's throwing or rotating or a punch or a kick. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, and this sounds logical, but oftentimes what people focus on are the muscles that generate the movement, okay? So if I'm trying to rotate, people think, well, I need to get really strong in the muscles that cause that rotation, that cause that, that twist or that throw. Now, that's logical, and there's some truth to that, but the reality is when you get to a particular level where you're practicing or playing on a, let's say, weekly basis, more of your, besides technique, I want to get that out of the way, of course, technique is the most important thing. Besides technique, it's actually more important to focus on the muscles that slow you down when you mm -hmm. rotate and stabilize. Decelerators. The decelerators. That actually becomes, the, those actually become the limiters it's mm. usually not the fact that you can't rotate and flick and throw the, the, the disc, but rather your body limiting how fast and how much you can rotate because yeah. the decelerating muscles and the stabilizer muscles can only support so much. That's actually where most people need to focus, not how hard I could twist, but rather what are the muscles that keep me from my body twisting in half or my arm yeah. coming off my body and stuff like that? In terms of his strength, he's you're totally on point with that. And most of what you're looking at with the actual movement of that is going to be attributed to practice and the skill um, and, and, you know, really being able to have smooth delivery with that. Now, to that point, even further of generating forces is really where you want to kind of stay and, and how how anchored can I get with my feet to the ground, how can I translate that into my hips? And then how can I generate that in my hips and then transfer that up into this ro rotary um, type of movement? Um, there's a couple different techniques to do. Like one I like to do with that is with the stick. Uh, so stick mobility is something I kind of, I went through this and, and there's ways of actually like intensifying intrinsic tension uh, within your core and to be able to, uh, basically you have the stick and you're, and you're, and you're pressing downwards. So you're creating more tension downward by contracting your muscles. And then we're actually like, uh, real slowly, almost, it's not isometric cause you're not, you know, stagnant. You're not just staying there, but you're actually just slowly rotating while you're pressing down, while you're tightening, um, and you're just training the body to respond with this really uh, supported, uh, tense um, uh, a movement. And so to, to be able to kind of start there and generate force and then go through that movement with more tension and control uh, will translate well to then now, on top of that, maintain your skill by doing the actual fluid movement in its free form. So um, between that and then there's coiling, which I don't know if you've ever seen with da David Weck, uh, kind of brought this up and there's ways of like being able to contract, um, you know, your obliques and get, uh, this whole lateral side of your body, all this lateral line connected. Uh, so you get this, this contralateral effect where you actually can like really stabilize the spine and, and generate force and then transfer that force one side to the other. 
Uh, so it's a little more advanced in terms of like athletic pursuits. Um, but really the, the overall basis of the concept is like, learn how to, to really anchor your body. I mean, you do this, deadlifts are good for this, right? Even just as simple as that, you know, a kettlebell swing is, is really good at that in terms of generating force then, and then being able to, uh, go through with fluid movement and release. So you have to be fast and loose. Okay. So that's, that's sort of the, the overall concept of that. And then train your body to be comfortable, uh, in that rotational space. And so to, to do that with the stick and kind of go through those movements on a consistent basis, uh, it's not going to put a lot of uh, wear and tear on the body. It's just going to keep priming and teaching the body to be comfortable in that and to not deviate or, or, or get out of a uh, tight form uh, that you need to be able to produce that uh, excess of power. Few questions, Justin. Did you do any series videos on Mind Pump TV with that? Like, did you do you have? Do we have anything that we've already created? In, along no, those lines? but I am going to be doing that in our subscription. Um, we're going to be going through a whole rotation series, okay. uh, and so that's going to be coming in. I did do some stick. Uh, mobility stuff with that move that I was talking about. That's on my and pump um, on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, on YouTube. Yeah, that was a there was a YouTube video I've done with that. Um, and so yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. But uh, other question, um, what about landmine stuff? Perfect. And this is this goes right in line with um, the coiling. David Weck stuff. David Weck stuff. Yeah. Like the offshoot of David Weck was in the landmine university. They came up with a really cool system of being able to to utilize. Uh, the landmine, just like you would a a power clean, or you could you could generate all this force, but it's it's less risky, uh, and it actually like works the body contralaterally, so you actually get to um, be able to to have a lot more effective control uh, doing these type of complicated uh, athletic pursuits. Because I mean, it's it's funny because I love talking about you know, bodybuilding and. Um, you know, on the show, we talk a lot about weight loss, building muscle and all that. But when we start talking about like sports specific pursuits, it gets a bit tricky and complicated because this is the pinnacle. This is like your body has to perform on command. You have to be able to maintain your, your body in space. Uh, and, and also too, like, you don't have to be able to slow down your body. So like those three factors alone make it a little more complicated. But uh, if you if you just slice that up into threes, you get really comfortable at generating force and control. Um, you, you constantly practice like rotational movements um, without maybe a whole lot of weight. It's just really like it's an intrinsic um, production of, of muscle tension. Uh, and then, um, you, you work on the technique, the dude, the technique is, is going to take you the furthest, uh, in, in terms of making that as fluid as possible. Yeah. You know, Aaron, I'll, I'll say, I'll communicate it, uh, a little differently. It's, uh, the, the, this like is Spanish more challenging yeah. <laughs> sign language in, this, in Espanol. It, this is more challenging, uh, because it's more specific. Okay. I can right. give general advice. But when you're talking about a specific movement, then the then the the advice gets a little bit more specific. But let me give you something that I think will apply uh, to what you're talking about. First off, I want to ask you how many days a week are you playing uh, disc golf? Like how often are you doing this? <clears throat> I don't get a chance to to do big throws like that, uh, like the big power throws. Very many days a week, usually one to two days a week, I get a chance to do it because of work and having a family and kids and stuff. I practice the shorter putting and stuff pretty much daily, but uh, but I, I don't get the chance to do that every single day because I don't have a big yard or anything. Do you do you always have a team of videographers and cameras following you? you throw <laughs> throw a frisbee. Oh, that's not me in the video. Uh, if you guys watch oh, the video, oh, I thought that was you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I wish that's that's. Uh, professional. Oh, I was gonna say, that's a, say I said that was a good looking throw right yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> so he's actually from that area, I think originally. His name is Paul Macbeth. Uh, okay. So okay. So um, all right. Let's get a little bit more specific. So j the base base fitness base exercise is going to benefit you, but you're already doing that. Okay. So that's that's first. Besides practice, uh, your sport. That's the first thing. Now, second. Let me give you an example of what I was talking about with your body limiting its ability to generate power based off of your body's ability to control the power and stabilize and decelerate. I love resistance bands for this because they they seem to apply more effectively than weights uh, or even cables, but not in the way you would think. So a lot of people would think I would use a resistance band 
and then I would twist and the resistance band would provide me with resistance in the direction that I'm twisting. Now, logically that makes sense because you're trying to get stronger in that, in that direction. Here's how I would apply a resistance band with someone who's generally fit already in the opposite direction. Okay. So imagine you're getting, you're, you're, you're mimicking a throw. The resistance band is pulling you towards the throw. Okay. Not away from the throw. So you're not pulling the band, but rather you're starting out by resisting the band. Then you mimic right. the throw. And what you have to do is you have to fight the resistance band from twisting you too far is essentially what's happening. So it's pulling me in the direction I'm throwing and I practice my throw. And because of that added boost, my stabilizers and decelerators are actually becoming stronger and more stable. Then I take the band off and I wow. throw and I feel stable as hell. Does that make sense? That does make sense. You've probably seen this. This is popular with like very high level sprinters. Yes. Where they will, they'll either get a car that's like pulling them yeah. like faster than they can actually run, and their body has to try and keep up exactly. that speed. Mm -hmm. Or they have these tools now where you you put around your waist and it slingshots Sling them shots, forward, yeah, yeah. and they have to learn to control their body at, at a faster speed than they could exactly. run by themselves. It's the exact same concept right. that he's explaining within your throw. Yeah, so that's a sports specific way to do it, and I think with your general workout and then practicing and experimenting with bands, like I just said, start slow because it's going to feel very awkward at first, I think yeah. you're going to see huge I would uh, lump that in with the skills training for yep. sure. Yeah. The, the actual strength training, anything you do in mass performance is going to help build that yep. strength stability and, and get your joints to respond adequately through all planes of motion. So that's really the, the basis of what you need to uh, apply in terms of like your training. The rest of this is, is now we're getting a little more um, very specific to what you want to do with your throw. Right. Okay. Cool. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Um, All right. I'd, I'd never thought to do the opposite. I do have a second question. Sure. If I could do that. I'm big. I'm an enthusiast in this game and I play the tournaments and everything. I, I'm not professional or anything. I compete at an amateur level, but, but <clears throat> I do tournaments and tournaments are typically two 18 round, sorry, 18 whole rounds with like a lunch break in between. They start at like eight o'clock in the morning typically, and they go till, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. It's a really long day and it's, <clears throat> it's a very taxing on the body. I was wondering how could I prime my muscles for a, such a big day um, and be prepared to get through that uh, the, and, and, well, for instance, it, you you I typically get about thirty thousand steps in in a, in a day like that, yeah, and over a hundred throws like the one you saw in the video. So it's it's very it leaves you very sore uh, for like the next few days afterward. I was wondering, like, should I be ramping up my steps the week before? To, steps to are what's less taxing here. It, the steps aren't what are, yeah. are beating you up yeah. and you'd have to train That's for it. It's, a it's the volume of throws. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you go from, and I'm just using hypothetical numbers, I have no idea what the true numbers are here, that where you go from a normal day, you th you throw the Frisbee, you know, 75 to 100 times in total in that your workout or your, or your day of playing a regular round. And then all of a sudden you go to this day where the volume jumps to 400, you're going to be real fucking sore because your just body is not ever use that volume. So the answer would be as you lead up to one of these tournaments would be to slowly increase the volume. If you want to yeah. get really uh, dialed in about it, you would actually mathematically break that down, like track how many of these big throws you do on one of those 18, how many total throws. And so right. you would, you would start practice, you would scale up in your practices leading up to that week. So if, again, using these hypothetical numbers, I said hundred is a normal day, say, you know, 600 is these big days or something crazy. You know, you would go, you know, the week, lead, the couple of weeks leading up, you go, now you're doing 125 to 150 throws, and then you're doing 175 throws, and you're slowly, incrementally just practicing that many throws. And you don't have to do it over a huge period of time. You could literally practice it within an hour, hour and a half, but that's how many throws you want to get in to build up that work capacity. Yeah. And just uh, one, I'll add to that. Make sure you just take off enough time before the tournament so right. that you feel fresh yeah. mm -hmm. the day of. And then lastly, day of, because, uh, you know, 99% of your performance yeah. uh, will Nutrition be- Nutrition and energy. Yeah. 99% yeah. of it will be dictated by what you did leading up to this tournament. 
but that one to 5% is going to be uh, hydration. So I would be drinking electrolyte water throughout the day. And then I'd be eating small meals throughout the day because you're, you're doing this all day long. Right. What I wouldn't do is wait for the lunch break, eat all my calories and then go and try and play. That's probably going to mess you up. So I'll try and have some little bit throughout the day so that you don't, you know, give your body all this digestion to do in between. Yeah. And right. in, in terms of just like priming, you, you don't want to focus too much because it's obviously going to be fatigued uh, already to begin with. So you don't want to do like a whole mobility session going into it. Like just, you know, the, the biggest movers in terms of uh, shoulder rotation, in terms of hip rotation, and just kind of like hold these isometric poses just to kind of prime those to respond adequately before you get going. But uh, it, just like he said, it's really, it's a hydration, it's an energy uh, management uh, a situation there that's going to help probably the most. Yep. Aaron, do you have MAPS performance, by the way? Because I feel like the workouts in there will suit you better. Yep. Uh, yeah, I bought the super bundle years ago. So. Beautiful. <laughs> Smart man. Beautiful. There you go. Awesome. Yep. All right, man. <laughs> do you, ha do you have a uh, prime pro though? I do not have prime pro. Oh, there you go. Let us send you that. Cause that'll help there you support go. Oh, and, right. and, and to the point of what we we're Absolutely. just making with. Some. I appreciate it. There you go. And I was going to add to the, uh, I, I actually, most people do carry around like protein bars or pop tarts or whatever in their bag. Mm. And, and I try to eat every three to four holes mo on most tournament days because, you know, one hole could take 10 to 15 minutes. Perfect. So, uh, so that's kind of what I do. Of course, I do need to do the electrolyte water. I do. I was drinking just regular water, but uh, oh, uh, yeah, oh, that'll, that'll make bro. a big difference. Make a big difference. difference. Yeah. Get some element, drink that throughout the day. Watch what happens. Absolutely. Awesome. All you right, got Aaron. it, man. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. No problem. The the example that was, that was specific as fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, we went off the deep end. On you that. know what though? I'm glad it's, we got a question well, like that know. because you know what I told him about where to put the resistance band and what's going on. A lot of people don't realize that it's counter intuitive. But just to give an example, a lot of people have tried this before. Where you go over to your friend's house, he has a punching bag mm -hmm. or punching mitts, and you hit the bag as hard as you can, and then you miss, and you know what it feels like when oh. you miss. Oh. Ouch! It yeah. sucks all of a sudden. Your oftentimes your power is not limited not limited by your by the amount of power you can generate, but rather by the amount of power your body allows you to generate, and that's limited by all the other stabilizers and decelerators. So it's like you get an athlete and you get them to stabilize and decelerate well. All of a sudden, they're yeah. so much more powerful. I think we went in such the specific route because there's a problem within like a sports specific training where. The idea is that like I'm gonna mimic and mock exactly like yes. what the swing is with yeah, resistance. Yeah, stupid. And so, but you see that everywhere still, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. people don't understand like, um, you know, the approach to this is really it's building the base, and then that's you know in conjunction is we're we're just trying to like do the skill to maintain, but you really it's about creating stable. Uh, high performing joints that, that have full range motion. Well, and to, you know, you both said it and you said it in different ways. And I think it's the most important thing. And also why that got so long winded and nuanced is that we could sit here without seeing this guy move and training him ourselves. It's hard to know where he's at in that spectrum of training an athlete. Yeah. And it, you, it, we could sit here and, oh, oh, this exercise and that exercise, and this is, <laughs> but then if he can't even, balance on one leg and do a, yeah. a toe touch or right. he doesn't do a proper deadlift really like and i'm not saying he's that guy but like where they're at in, in there oh their, totally because the advice could have literally been like, just go throw exactly. the frisbee more that's right <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and with good foundational type that's of it. lifts yeah. because you you like to and justin was making this point like you you have to first lay that solid foundation before yeah. we start stacking these other crazy complex movements and exercises on there thinking that it's going to give you this greater output. It's like mm -hmm. you, there's so much, and this is what you find with like young athletes. Like, in, like if you're a kid listening to this in high school and you want to get good at your sport and you're like, Oh, I'm a, I'm a wide receiver. What exercise should yeah, I, I do? To yes. get, yeah. And it's like, well, squat. can you not squat and deadlift <laughs> with great form? Because like, there's exactly so why we, I think it went that direction. Cause we could, you could put somebody, I just want to get a better uh, shot in basketball. I just want to uh, throw the ball farther. Uh, you you know, as a quarterback, I want whatever it is, like whatever your pursuit is, that's like super specific. You got to start with the base. That's well, right. I'll tell you what, that video that he sent was a pro throwing a, a disc. Yeah, yeah. That's why I gave the advice. I, I know. Did. That's why I brought <laughs> because you I saw the throw. Was, that's like, why I brought that up yeah. because I was yeah. like, damn, that's a good ass throw. Yeah, and with that guy, that's what I would do. Yeah. I would do the reverse band. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I would do. <laughs> saw all the cameras. Like, this guy walk around with all the cameras. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Hopefully, funny. Andrew puts that in the video because that was funny. Our next caller is Igor from Connecticut. Igor, what's happening? How can we help you? 
How are you guys doing? Hello, it's great to meet all of you. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. Right on. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I was actually wondering if you guys ever get tired of hearing this first part of how everybody appreciates you, but, you know, I, I can't help but, you know, express my gratitude to you guys and you know, how much I look up to you. I've been listening to your show for as long as I've been in the gym. So I just wanted to, you know, thank you all for, for that. I thank appreciate you, it. Thank, thank you very you. much. So uh, just a little bit of context before I jump into my question. Um, I've, I'm 18 years old. I've been working out consistently for roughly two and a half to three years. Um, I do plan to compete in a bodybuilding show and I don't know, maybe the next five, 10 years. Right. And, uh, I had a question about programming. So I keep hearing in, in your guys' podcast that in, in order to avoid a plateau or, you know, stagnate my, my strength gains or muscle gains, it's important to keep modifying the type of stimulus that you send to your body. Uh, and the way to do that is to change the rep ranges. For most of my journey in the gym, I've been staying in the mid range. So from 10 to 12 reps. Uh, just because I like it, nah, it, it's not like high reps, uh, fatigue me too much with low reps causes any sort of pain. It's just what I tend to prefer. Uh, but I do want to change it because I have found that my strength and my muscle gain has been slowing down for the past couple of months. So the only, th so my question is that I don't really know how to implement those rep ranges in my, in my programs and my workout. If I should opt for doing, you know, like big lifts with uh, lower reps in the beginning of my workout, or if I should, uh, just change for my whole workout. Uh, I, I don't really know how I can implement that well into my, my, uh, program. Okay. Igor, this is going to be easy. Uh, yeah. This is <laughs> Maps easy. Anabolic, coming your way. Yeah. So just, just, um, <laughs> oh. cause there'll be arguments yeah. as to whether or not you should mix the rip rep ranges up. And, uh, I think you're better off training in, in a low rep range yeah. for three to five weeks than a moderate one for three to five and then a higher rep one. So I would go, since you've been in 10 to 12 for so long, I'd like to see you in a like five rep range for the next uh, three to six weeks. Now, it's true that some exercises uh, do better with lower reps and others with higher reps. Like five reps of like laterals, probably not. You might want to go a little higher. But generally speaking, mm -hmm. You're, you're probably better off just from a mindset standpoint to train for a few weeks, at least in a different rep range with all of your exercises. So the whole workout looks like it's lower reps than what you're used to or higher reps than what you're used to. And the reason why we do it that way, the mindset, it's, it's different. When you do sets of five, it's totally different feel. You're not aiming for the pump. It's a different mindset then when you're doing sets of 15. And so to go from like five to 15 to 12, all in the same workout, it tends to not be as effective from that standpoint. Oh, I mean, if your goal is to become a bodybuilder in the next five to 10 years, you want to get into that space. When you're, this, you're young right now, we want to be packing on as much muscle and size or how I would say clay, right? So if you, when you get ready to get ready for a show, all you're doing is revealing all the hard work that you did the prior years of that. And one of the best things you could do right now is to pack on muscle, pack on size and muscle right now. Lifting heavy is one of the fastest, best ways that you could possibly do that, especially since you only lift in the 10 to 12 rep range. And then really what you're doing when you're getting ready for a show is you're just revealing all the hard work that you've done in the past by cutting, cutting calories and getting shredded and then, and showing that. So Man, you uh, you will absolutely benefit from Maps Anabolic, and I, I would just I would say stay in Phase One for a couple extra weeks, right? I mean, just yeah. run out run Anabolic exactly the way it's laid out. The only difference is I'd say instead of transitioning out of Phase One, like we recommend after three weeks, maybe stick there for five weeks, 
and probably repeat that program twice, and you're going to see the same way. You'll get a ton of benefits. Yeah. Have you done a full body breakdown, like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday full body routine yet? Yeah. So uh, before uh, this, right, I was running a sort of a modified PPL structure uh, where I would do, instead of doing all the push muscles all together, I would do, for example, on Monday, I would do my chest and my biceps so I could load my biceps more uh, and so that I wouldn't have the fatigue that I would have on my triceps had I worked out my, my triceps with my chest on the same day. Uh, and then, you know, on Tuesday, I would run my chest, I, I mean, my back with my triceps just so I can load both of those muscle groups up more um, and so that I don't fatigue them so much while working out other other muscle groups. Igor, I feel like you're overthinking it because of your age. Let me ask you a couple more questions. No, he's thinking like a, like you, you'd be following yeah. a bunch of bodybuilders. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. Like, okay, so look, okay, yeah. you're 18. You're 18. So I want to see, young. I want to see your Instagram feed. Yeah. That's what I want to see. How, uh, how, what, what, how much do there, you, there's a lot of the, the so-called, uh, fitness influencers, yeah, the, yeah, the ones that I deem most worthy, yeah. but you know, yeah, yeah. how, okay. So, uh, how, what's your body weight at? Um, and then you do 10 to 12. So what do you work out with, with your squat, your overhead press, your bench press, your deadlift? So give me your body weight and then give me some of the, the weights that you end up using for those lifts and be honest. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. So, uh, right now I'm staying at around 190 to 200 pounds. I'm at a higher body fat percentage right now. I believe it's, uh, low to mid 20%. Okay. Uh, if I'm doing like 10 reps on, you know, my bench press, I can probably push 145 pounds. That's my, that's my weakest body part right now. Uh, on the squat, I can push on the squat and deadlift. I, I can push a, a bit more on the squat. I did 200 and 260 pounds, I believe. Last time, and I and I did for about like eight reps. I could probably push for another two, but I wasn't trying to go for failure. On the last time that I did that, on my deadlift, I I've done two hundred and eighty pounds for again around eight reps. I could push for another another two to, you know, go to failure. But I, I try to stay away from failure as much as I can. You okay? And you want a body build in, a, in in five to ten years at your age? You, just get strong. You got a long ways. To, I mean, you can go real far yeah. with that. And that's, what's going to put the muscle on you. In fact, I don't even know if yeah. I, I th I'd want you to do maps, power lift. I still would, I would still do anabolic that. first. And then that I still I just, that, that program is just, he's just going to put more muscle on do, You're training for strength. You're going to put more muscle on than you are training for bodybuilding right now. hundred percent, hundred percent. You can get your, you can get your anabolic is that though. Yeah. You get your deadlift up to four, 450 your squat into the mid threes your bench into the mid twos like you're gonna have a lot more muscle on your body for sure yeah so when i when i try to go for lower reps because sometimes i do work out uh you know my big lifts with some lower reps if i try to go for you know uh the lower rep range i i can push more weight so on my bench i've done 185 for one rep on my squat, I've done 300 for two. And on my deadlift, I've done 315 for three. Yeah. So, you know, I, I usually just, just take it back a little bit when, if I'm, if I know that I'm doing higher reps, which I typically do. Yeah. I'd go, you know, I mean, yeah, you're good, maps bro. anabolic to mass power lift. You'll put more muscle on doing that than you will almost anything else at your age and what you're doing yeah. by far. Strength should be, that's it. You're, you've got a long ways to go with strength mm -hmm. to worry about, mm -hmm. um, you know, like fine tuning with bodybuilding training and programming. Got to like build that. your base as, as far mm -hmm. as you can. You'll go way further. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And would you guys recommend that I stay at a relatively maintenance, maintenance uh, regarding to my cow? Sur no, maintenance to surplus. You don't want to be Oak, under. I mean, that, yeah, we're trying to build considering that. Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to be okay. in a cut at all. So you maintenance to surplus. You don't need to be in a big surplus. You don't need to be eating, you know, 1000 mm -hmm. calories over. Uh but you also want to be fed. We're trying yeah. we're trying to grow right now. So, totally. you know, you know, stay up on your yeah. calories for sure. You're hungry, feed yourself. Just make good choices. 
And I, I, we'll have Doug send over yeah, Anabolic, yeah. right? So we'll send that over to you for free. And then the next recommendation after that, I would say, is Powerlift. But I, I love that. I love that path. Okay. So Anabolic, Powerlift, sound, sounds great. You got it, Thank man. you guys so much. All right, you know, I really appreciate your time. You got it, man. Keep it up, man. Yeah. Thank you. All right. You got it. Uh, I had a guy, I told you guys this before, I had a guy, a dude was, you know, he was in his forties, been working out for years, ex bodybuilder, like knew what he was talking about, natural competitor. Tell me when I was 16, like I thought he was going to give me secrets to training, you know? Yeah. And he goes, just yeah. get strong. Yeah. <laughs> Work out three days a week, get strong, a bench, deadlift, a squat, eat deadlift a lot of protein. Yeah. And I thought he was bullshitting me. I'm like, this guy doesn't want to tell me. Yeah. It was the best advice I could have ever <laughs> followed. <laughs> You know, this kid, if he just, if he just got stronger, you mean he's at 18? Yeah. 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 Oh my God. And, and he your, would go so much further. And to your point back about like a lot of uh, those exercises that maybe um, people don't realize you. So in terms of like pull-ups or dips, or you can load those and do less reps. Yes. And so I, I just think that I just want to bring that up because I think a lot of people look at, at certain um exercise like that don't even it doesn't even come across their mind or even like um core exercises too as well you like can treating them. it more as a, yeah. a an actual strength exercise but you know that in regard to like his pursuit he just really needs to focus on ways of getting strong totally 100 percent. look if you like mind pump head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides uh, download all of them they cost nothing you can also find all of us on instagram justin is at mind pump justin i'm at mind pump to stefano and adam is at mind pump adam 